What's going on, Alan? How you doing out there in the UK? Everything all right. <laughs> As usual, with everyone I talk to, we're having a good conversation before we start recording, and then I have to stop us and go, "Hey, let's start recording," because otherwise, we're not all these to talk about. By the time we start recording, it's going to be over. <laughs> we're going to be talking about nonsense. But I wanted to bring you on for a lot of reasons. One, I, I like a lot of the posts you've been putting up on Instagram about the pandemic and your views on it. And I appreciate that you're sharing your strong views. That's much needed. So let's talk about that in a little bit. But what I really wanted to get into is your experiences with Charles Poliquin, your stories with Charles Poliquin. We were yeah. going to have you on the LLA show maybe a few months after he passed away in 2018. And then we put the show on hold for a while. So we didn't get an opportunity to do that. So I wanted to have you have that opportunity now to get into that. Yeah, I think, you know, it was such a tragic passing. It came so unexpectedly. And yeah. uh, the wake of that was the, the whole litany of information that he left behind. And certainly he was quite vocal in his, his last few years about wanting to get his information out, create people who are going to be um, taking over the mantle as, as he kind of, um, as he got older um, and have the same level of uh, understanding and knowledge out there so that it didn't pass on with him. And, you know, I was very, very fortunate. I, I met him on a number of occasions, uh, always through certifications and courses, and had, had the good opportunity to socialise with him as well. And he was, you know, he was as good company, you know, outside of lectures as he was in. You know, he always, he had a, an excellent way with an anecdote in a story. And that was really what reinforced a lot of the stuff that I remember. The re I didn't know that one. Sorry, that's my Alexa just kicking up. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. Um, but, yeah, it, it was one of those things where you actually... He, he, he had a very good manner of, of explaining things with anecdotes that would stick in your mind. And so you, your, your, you know, your recollection of these things were, were really enhanced. But, yeah, he was, uh, he was an incredible character and sorely missed. You know, he, he was, I think you said in one of the um, early podcasts, if you haven't heard of this strength coach, you're really in the wrong business. And I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, it was, I actually, my first contact with Charles Poliquin was early in my career. It was around 2002. And I've been a big fan of his for years. I used to read all of his articles in Muscle Media Magazine. I don't know if you guys got that out there. Bill, Bill Phillips Magazine. I mean, this is, this is 1990s, late 1990s. So I'm not sure if it was even distributed worldwide. But he had a column in there called Ask the Strength Coach, something to that effect. Poliquin yep. Principles just came out around that time. So I was, I was definitely a big fan of his information. And when I got into the industry, one of the methods I used to network with people I wanted to speak to is this interview method where I would contact people and ask them if they would be willing to do an interview for publication, either in T Nation or sometimes some of these articles got in the Iron Man magazine, other places. But I didn't really know where the interview would land until after it was done. So there was no reason for the person in the, on the other side to say, yeah, sure, I've never heard. Here's some random guy emailing me. He has no website. I've never heard of this guy. I'm going to add And these are conversations recorded on the phone. It's not me just emailing him 10 questions and then he responds yeah. back. So there's a certain time commitment there. But I was, I was surprised with how much success I had with that. And I was really excited when I had the opportunity to talk to Charles. And we talked for about maybe an hour and a half. We had a really good conversation. And what's funny is Charles is a really blunt guy. So if I asked him a question, I, I remember one time I said, hey, you're a big, uh, do, do you use, you're a, do you use active release technique? I said something, I said something about active release technique. Yeah. And his response is like, yeah, obviously I use it. <laughs> you know, like that kind of <laughs> stuff. And I was like, okay, all right, that's where this is going to go. And, but what's <laughs> funny is I wasn't sure if he enjoyed the conversation until maybe a week later, because after I did the call, and this is, this is, pre-technology such as what we have now what like this medium where it's really easy to do this stuff yeah. this is i had, I had an, an actual tape recorder that i plugged into my phone to record the call and then i would lit and then i would listen to the conversation and type it out i would transcribe it out because there was nowhere to send an audio interview no one was going to take that there was I mean, the internet was most people didn't even have high-speed internet at that time so it yeah. would have taken tweet three days to download a two-hour conversation so I transcribed the whole thing. And when you transcribe the whole thing, you're listening to it over and over again. So you really get all of the messages. That's the plus side of it. Yeah. But I sent him a copy of the transcription after I did it. And he was really impressed with how professionally done it was. There was no errors. It, everything was on point. I didn't edit anything he said. And after that, all of a sudden, his tone changed a bit. Because I yeah. think he realized, and I think when looking back on it, I think Charles deals with a lot of people that just talk. 
It's like, yeah. okay, here's another guy who's talking about his aspirations and what he's going to do. Because he was asking me about that too. I go, yeah, I'm just getting started. I'm teaching this kettlebell stuff, this, that, and so forth. And I'm sure he talks to people all the time that are looking for nuggets from him to, and how to be successful. And then they don't do anything with it. So you get a little jaded. But when he, I think he was very impressed with the fact that I turned that interview around really fast. I mean, maybe a, maybe three days after we recorded it, I had the transcription done and emailed him for his approval. And he yeah. said he never had that kind of turnaround before. I remember him distinctly saying that. So his, his view of me changed at that point. And then I didn't talk to him for a long time after that. I talked to him maybe six years later, I got an email. Yeah. So it was, I'm really impressed with the subject line. I'm like, okay. Is this, the, is this a newsletter blast where he's talking about a movie? He saw? <laughs> you know, what's, a, what's this about? And I open it up. He's like, hey, Mike, I've been following your career. And I've got to say, I'm super impressed with your development and your articles are excellent and on point and so forth. And I, and I, I had to do a double take. I was like, wow, to, to get, yeah. get that kind of validation from one of the best, if not the best in the industry, especially as a really young coach in the game, that was very invigorating. I mean, I was, I was really excited about that. I'm not someone who chases praise, really, but that one really made an, an indelible point. I really, I really appreciated him re getting out to me. And then years later, I got him on the LA, LLA show, and he was great. But he also wrote this article about me. This is the other one that just blew my mind. Maybe in 2010, I want to say, 2009-10, he wrote this article that said, who I respect in the industry. And the whole article was about me. And people were lighting up my my email and I was getting all these texts and so forth. They're like, Hey, have you seen this yet? And I go, I don't know what you guys are talking about. And I finally got around to it and I was like, wow, this is an article about me. Just out of the blue. He didn't tell me he was going to write this. He didn't even send it to me after he wrote it. <laughs> he just put it out there and all of these other people saw it. And a lot of his followers gravitated towards me after that. All of a sudden, yeah. all these people, my, my Facebook followers went way up. All of a sudden there's more people buying products and people are looking into me. So he's he's basically in in America when when Oprah Winfrey used to talk about a product they called that the Oprah effect because everybody would go out and buy it. A, a more recent one would be Joe Rogan if he promotes something he has such a huge platform whoever sells that product is probably going to have exponential growth. Charles is basically that figure in our industry where if he gave you that stamp of approval, especially taking the time to write an article about you, that would go a long way because he doesn't do that with a lot of people. He had more negative things to say about most trainers <laughs> than he did positive. <laughs> this is it. I mean, he was, this is what I liked is that um, probably, you know, I would say the three people that have made the biggest influence in my life were my dad, my martial arts instructor, and Charles. Wow. And actually, each, um, point was a drop-off point and a meeting point to the next person so from having trained in martial arts i then decided that was really what i wanted to do because you know you've talked about it a million times doing a job that you love um is is completely fulfilling but for a long time i was in that exact state that you you've talked about in previous podcasts and and in in your book where you're doing a job that you hate a detest you wake up in the morning you feel sick i was in a sales job that made me want to puke and yeah. um, you you then train, you try and out train that lifestyle. You right. I'll go to the gym and let all this, you know, this this uh, pent up aggression and annoyance out. It doesn't work like that. You've yeah. got to reverse engineer it and say, no, my life needs to be good. And my training needs to complement that because my right. training will improve. You cannot train angry at 40 or 50 years old, maybe oh. in your 20s. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so so um, from that point, I. I I moved from doing my martial arts, which I loved as a hobby, into qualifying for a personal trainer. Um, and when when I was introduced to Charles, it was indirectly from that that I came across yourself. Um, because, of course, and, and it was actually, it wasn't so much even the kettlebells that interested me. It was the hormonal optimization. And I wanted to expand my horizons on that. I thought, I don't want to get locked into, even though it's a fascinating, and uh, I still look back now and think, amazingly prescient um, uh, field of information that he was giving out. I wanted to keep keep opening the door to that and reading more people, even if that contradicted ideas and even if that didn't necessarily, it wasn't always coherent or cohesive um, because that's where you learn for yourself. And uh, yeah, you're 100% right. I was, um, in a different way, I was very fortunate. I, as a result of him, I met Christian Thibodeau on a course. Yeah. And, uh, and Christian said to me, look, why don't you write for um uh the the side 
the, the, the female athlete portion of body of her testosterone nation. And I was quite early on in my career. I remember just saying something him something to him in the airport, and he said, I like that quote. I'm going to use that in my article. That was good enough for me. I was like, Christian's going to use an, my quote in an article. Right, I'm going to read that. And next thing, he said to me, why don't you write? And I, I kind of had that imposter syndrome first online. Nah, nah. And I put it off for ages. And I thought, how badly wrong can it go? You know, it's the things you don't do you regret. So I, I, I wrote quite a few articles for them. And, and um, you know, Charles was very supportive of that because a lot of them were on hormonal optimization. They were on biosignature and, and that element. And then from there, um, he invited me to a course in Dublin, just free of charge. He just said, you know, you've qualified in this one. Come along to that one which was incredibly generous. You know, these were courses that were hundreds of pounds. Yeah. And then the, the, the best one for me was I just opened my emails one day and uh, he said, you know, you've been invited to a body composition internship in Rhode Island. Uh, let us know if you can make it. So I'm, I'm reading through and it's got the links to all the hotels and everything. I'm like, where's the costing on this? Because this sounds amazing. Look at, yeah. you know, Dr. Tom O'Brien talking about gluten intolerance. You've got two workouts a day in, in the facility. It's like a dream come true. So I emailed back and said, this looks like you're just offering it to me free of charge. And they went, we are. So wow. I was like, what? Yeah. And I mean, I was very fortunate. You know, that I was that alongside me were people like Nick Mitchell, uh, Damien Mayer, Wolfgang Unsold. You know, these are these are people in, certainly in the um, in the European sector of the fitness industry who are really well, well um, considered. So, you know, I, I'm. I was absolutely, you know, got, yeah, absolutely I'm going to be there. Do you know what I mean? Don't have to ask twice. And I saw him at a, at a, a course pre between, and I said to him, you know, I wanted to say how grateful I am for that. That That's really, and he said, look, you ask some of the more sensible questions, smarter questions in, in BioSig. He said, the more I show you, the more I teach you, the more knowledge you can dispense and the better you are. And he said, and it reflects well on my business. You know, you will generate more business for me. And I thought, you know, he, he was, he was a, a very, strong believer in the law of attraction and and certainly in gratitude being a primary driving force of your life well before other people were doing it. and then you read about ceos people like tim ferris um and uh you are countless other people who say you know gratitude mindfulness are the cornerstones of success in business he was doing that and you know i, I credit him i'm looking at it now i've got a gratitude diary just over there I write in it every day, every day, 10 things I'm grateful for and why. And um, it's something that I get all my clients to do without fail. Because what you appreciate, appreciate. You know, it's, you could say, I have got no problem with somebody saying the law of attraction is woo woo bullshit. Yeah. But neuroplasticity and a Buddhist mindset says we become what our thoughts are primarily set on. You know, if you get a new car, you know. You're thinking this Audi is lovely and you're there and suddenly all you can see are Audi. Well, that is gratitude. And when you start to focus on the things that you're, you're that are positive in your life and uh, uh, something that are fulfilling, the, they're the immediate antidote to stress. So you think, oh, well, the opposite to stress is happiness. But happiness is an end point. I can't just go, yeah, oh, I'm stressed. Hold on a second. Right now I'm happy. It doesn't work that way. You have to have a transitional bridge and that bridge is gratitude yeah and it was really you know it was it was um it was that you know and and a really very powerful moral compass as well that he had you know a moral compass he would start every election and say if i catch any of you cribbing this i'll sue you he said because as far as i'm concerned you're taking money out of my my daughter's mouth and i respected that because i had a new born daughter well no she would have been about um six at the time and my son was on the way and i remember thinking yeah you know this is somebody who's protecting his intellectual property he's very generous with it but you know i still see trainers ripping him off so you know i i uh, have very strong feelings about that i always credit if i do a workout that's based on him or that is um uh always directly from him you know if it's like body composition style training I'll say, even if it's my take on it, I'll say, this is where I got the, the idea from. This is why we do this tempo. Because people never look down at you for that sort of thing. They'll respect you for, for taking the time to invest. Like when I did the kettlebell course with you, you know, you come back, you, I never pass off anything that you've ever told me as my own. 
But people like the fact, hold on, he's really investing in his career. He's talking to people who are at the top of their, at the pinnacle of their um, industry. That's never going to work against you. So why have that kind of uh, hubris to think, oh, no, I, I got here automatically. You didn't. You know, everybody had to learn all the right. time. Yeah, that's a really good point. We see that quite a bit in the industry. The example that's most prominent is, are you familiar with John Brookfield, the guy who created Battling Ropes? No, no. Well, I, know, I know Battling Ropes, so I didn't know. Yeah. But you are familiar with Battling Ropes, right? Yeah. You know what that is. Now, here's, this, is, this is where I'm going to go with this. See, John Brookfield, he created that system. This wasn't something that he read about in a old-time muscle magazine and then just brought back for a yeah. new generation. I mean, he came up with the system. I believe another guy, John Bruni, he's been on the LLA show. He might have helped him with that system. I forget the details. But anyway, that's John's baby. Now, back in 2008, he taught at one of my courses, Collision Course. I used to have a video series of it. And at that time, Battling Ropes was starting to become known within fringe training circles. It was people that train with kettlebells and club bells that are looking for something novel. It was starting to, to, to blow up a little bit, but not too much. A couple of years later, though, it was everywhere. It's on every UFC promo of an athlete training for a fight. It's yeah. everywhere, right? Everyone's doing battling ropes, NFL players and so forth. People start coming up with their own battling rope videos, their battling rope books. Guess how many of these people gave credit to John Brookfield? Zero. Not one. That's why you've never heard of them. Not yeah. one person did that. Now, I'm actually going to have... Sincere and I are having John on the show in a couple of yeah, end of the month, and I can't wait to ask him this question of how do you feel about that? Because he's yeah. still out there teaching certifications. He's still out there doing his thing, and he's pretty world-renowned. He's known as the man with the strongest grip in the world, and his, his hands are the size of two basketballs put together. He's got these huge hands and ridiculous strength. Very impressive guy, but he's not the most marketable guy. And when you yeah. look at him, I mean, he's very physically imposing. He's really yeah. strong, but he's not some ripped Adonis. And that's why I think people saw an opportunity. They go, hey, I have a way better physique and a more marketable yeah. look than John. So I'm just going to take his system. And it was either done. I, I'm, some people I know for a fact did it intentionally because I know they know Brookfield and probably learned it from him and they just never gave yeah. him credit. Other people, it's probably so down the line that they probably don't even realize that he created it. They learned it from someone else, and then they went went off with it. But that yeah. that's one of many, many examples. And it, it's like you said, somehow people think that if they give credit, it diminishes them in some way, when it's really the opposite. If I write an article about DHEA and I include Charles' views on it, instead of trying to put his views as mine— so I sound clever, that takes away from the article. It diminishes yeah. the article. If I have a quote from him in there, here's what world-renowned strength coach Charles Poliquin says about the importance of the DHEA cortisol ratio. That shows you're well-researched. Like 100%. You said that. You know? 100%. And, and actually, this goes back to, and it was through your podcast, I heard it, the guy who des developed Jungle Gym, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten yeah, his John name. Hines. John Hines, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely guy. I mean, that was one of those podcasts I listened to on multiple occasions yeah. because it really disgusted me as well. Because I yeah. thought, here's somebody. And what no, what I actually respected was he was very philosophical about it. He didn't come across as at all angry or bitter about it. But let's face it, you know, his idea was taken wholesale. And you just look at it now and think to yourself, um, it's it's you know, he's still out there, but you know, TRX stole the march on that. And um and we know where we're at with that, you know, it's uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the market leader, you know, if I say to, to most people, Jungle Jim, they'll be like, I don't know what you're talking right. about. That's another really, that, that's even a much bigger example. Yeah, I forgot all about that. I, I remember when that, that whole thing happened, and that's why I wanted to bring John on to talk about all of that. Mm. That was a pretty, pretty blatant ripoff of his system, too. And they could have... They could have gone in their own direction with something similar and given him credit, and maybe it wouldn't have been that big of a deal where it rubbed John so incorrectly or wrong. But what they did is, I mean, they turned him down as if, nah, I don't think this is really a fit for us. And then they went on and made their own version of it. And yeah. the, the problem with, it's not really a problem, it's just a reality of business, is that the first person to blow it up in a big way is going to be seen as the inventor. Yeah. So it doesn't, a lot of times in marketing, they always say first one in is going to get the largest percentage of the market share. And my caveat to that is the first one in 
who takes massive action is going to get the biggest market share. So John is a very smart inventor. Mm. He's not the best at business development and marketing, though. Mm. And the lesson he should learn from that is that that's to his peril, how dangerous it is to not be really good at business development. That's something you need to take charge of. And that's something mm. I tell a lot of trainers is that you need to control distribution. So I, I talked to one guy, actually it was a guy in the UK, and he was talking about how he, he had this book idea, but he, he, he was going back and forth with these publishers and he wasn't sure how much they're gonna do for him and all that. And I said, why don't you just write that book? Why don't you just self-publish it and sell it to your people? Mm. And that idea just went over his head. He goes, why would I do that? You know, who's going to buy it? You know, that's kind of his mentality. And yeah. my attitude is, if you don't have a list of people that are interested in buying whatever product you're thinking about coming up with, why would some other company make that product for you and create an audience? And if they do, they're going to keep most of the market share, which is honestly fair because you're not doing yeah. anything. Yeah. You go, well, I'm the one who created the product. I'm like, yeah, you created the product. You're going to create a product that no one's ever going to hear about because you don't know how to get it out there. Yep. Distribution is crucial. This is something I learned really early in the business that if I leave my prob my chances of success in the hands of anyone else, that's going to stack the deck way against me for being successful. I need to have my own newsletter list. I need to have a website that people come to. And then by the time I started selling my first DVDs, I had a list of people to sell to. So you, you have that initial burst right off the bat. I'm not making a video and then going, how am I going to get it out there? You should already know how you're going to get it out there. That should already be in there. When I started selling nutrition supplements, it was 2012. I came out with recovery oil, but the yeah. testosterone booster is my flagship product. And that came out in 2013 and that changed everything for my business. But yeah. the reason why it did so well is I have a big following from all the years of things I've done before that. If yeah. I came out with that testosterone booster, let's say my first year in business, it would have been a colossal failure. Yeah. And it's expensive to launch a product. This is not something where you just buy 10 bottles and see if it works. You have, you have to commit to usually 5,000 bottles at least initially, sometimes more. So that's a, that's a good amount of cash out the door that you may not recoup anytime soon if you don't have your own distribution. And then you're thinking, okay, let me get it into some of these other retailers and so forth. Okay, fine. Most of them aren't going to be interested. And the ones who are are going to take at least 50%. Absolutely. So that, and that's okay. But now you're going to have to sell way more. Now, if you sell direct to the customer, you don't have to sell anywhere near as much yeah. to make great income. And you're controlling your destiny a lot more because those distributors at any moment could say, we don't want to sell your product anymore. And then what are you going to do? So but distribution is crucial. And also, you know, what you accomplished with, because obviously, you know, I've, I've personally purchased your items, is that you had complete, utter autonomy over them. So there's no, I think, there's always the danger in any business where you're relying on anybody else right. on having to compromise. And I think if you're somebody who's reached our stage, you're not prepared to compromise. You know, you right. think to yourself, this is the vision I have. This is what I want to do. And I've been as guilty as the other guy you were mentioning of prevaricating. And then I reached a point where I just thought, you know what? It's, it's just do it. Do it and then reverse engineer it if there are issues along the way. But you spend so much time faffing around and, and not committing to things that, that that does not do you any favors and you just prevaricate. You know, I had a friend who said, do you want to do a charity parachute jump? You know, and I was like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 15,000 yeah. feet, I'm in, I'm in. You know, I had I hadn't had hip surgery at the time. I had to lie on the form about my age because they would have never got me, let me get on the plane with <laughs> my hip in the state it was. But I thought, fuck it, it's my one opportunity in life. You know, there, I was invited into a Channel 4 TV show to, to talk about um, coconut oil and oil pulling for dental health. And right. I was warned off that by so many people. Don't do it. I think it's going to be this. I, I thought, do you know what? I know what I'm talking about. I, I can argue my case. And, uh, you know, more people have been, you know, the graveyard's full of people who, who had all these ideas and just thought, yeah, but it's not in my place. And I thought, what's the worst that can happen? You know, um, so, no, I'm a big believer. And I think you're right. It's autonomy. And it's also when you seize control of that situation and you have have the, the wherewithal, you don't have to compromise on it. You know, um, you put the bulb by natalensis in that you wanted. There'll be loads of other companies that will maybe go for one that wasn't in the studies. And we all know what the difference is. 
yeah. you know maybe they're not as many active constituents and this is an argument i have all the time you know, when I'm explaining things to, not an argument, a discussion I have with clients, when they're like, well, what's the difference between this and this? And it's, you know, it's it's the, the potency, uh, the um, uh, the effectiveness, and also, you know, what you get is not always what's on the bottle. So right. um, I, I completely agree. I think that's uh, that's key. You want to be, you want to be at the heart of your business. Don't let anybody else write your book. You have to write your book for you. Right. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to put this clip up later. I just wrote a couple ideas this morning on why people don't become successful. Just some of the reasons. Now, it's obviously there's more than just three or four reasons, but there's a couple that really stick out to me because I've just come across them so many times, especially in our industry. And one is the mentality of self-rejection. And this goes back to what you said. You're so worried about a negative outcome that you just reject yourself before you put yourself out there. So for, I mean, a, an obvious example that men can relate to is you see a woman that you find really attractive and you go, I should go up to her and introduce myself and maybe ask her out to dinner. But then you start thinking it through and you go, she's not going to be interested in me. Why would she be interested in me? I mean, if someone like her, she would have no interest in me. So I'm not yeah. even going to bother. I'm not even going to bother doing it. It's like, oh, you know, I'm so smart. I'm not even going to bother doing it. So you basically, re you didn't even give her a chance to reject you. You rejected yourself. No, you don't yeah. know what would have happened. And if, who cares if she's not interested? That's okay. Yeah. Not everyone you talk to is going to be, I mean, if in May, in America, right, professional baseball, if you hit the ball three times out of 10, you're a superstar. You're missing 7% yeah. of the time. And most of the guys there don't even hit it three times out of 10. There's more one or two times out of 10, and you're still on the team. Exactly, so, yeah. So people have these, this, 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 this self-rejection is a big one in business too because i've given ideas to people where they talk about stuff and i go hey here's a couple of things that may work for you and it's always yeah but and whenever someone says yeah but whatever comes after it is not going to be anything useful no <laughs> and, and I, I always say not to toot my own horn so much but I, i'm successful in this industry you know that's just a fact so when i'm giving you advice you don't have to treat it as the gospel but it may behoove you to just shut up and listen to it and think it through and say, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's actually achieved these things that I want to achieve instead of thinking you know more than I do when you've achieved nothing. You, know, you haven't achieved anything. So why? What, what, you're only an expert on how not to do anything. That's what you're an expert on. You're an expert on self-rejection. And this is it. And in the same way as if you're going up to 10 women and asking them out and you're getting rejected by seven. You know, there's a, you, you're still there's that 30 percent success rate and they could be, you know, they could be models. But also it's the law of repeated endeavor. You know, you, you, you're going to have to. Whether people like it or not, I would never have posited myself when I started as the best martial artist. But I was obsessive and I practiced and I put the hours in. And you know what? It's like Charles used to say, success leaves clues. You look at the people right. who are successful, you model yourself on them because there are commonalities and patterns of behavior that they've all done and you know you just absorb as many of them as you can and just you know um and and it was the same with martial arts you know it's like that woody allen joke um what was it i think it's like 80 percent of success is just turning up i just turned up i right. just turned up i wasn't naturally gifted i wasn't naturally coordinated but i turned up and it ended up with me i was you know gifted i was and not, you know, fortunate enough that I was able to go to China and compete. Um, I went to Malaysia. I competed in the, in Europe. So it it was it's putting the hours in, and the hours have the reward. And so, like you said, you know, if people want to listen or don't, that's their that's their entitlement. But you 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 know, you're missing a point. It's like Warren Buffett saying to you, you know, Mike, um, I've I've got a few ideas on stocks, and you're like, ah, Anna, I've done well, thanks a lot. But you know, I appreciate the insight, but um. You're going to listen. You're going to listen. Yeah, not not only that's a good example because I have I actually have listened to his advice reading his books. Yeah. Years ago, he said, you're not going to beat index funds. So just put your money in there. And that was when yeah. I was probably 26. And that's what yeah. I've done ever since then. And it's worked out nicely. <laughs> you know? yeah. I just throw in, I just max out index funds every year and I just watch it in the long run. Keep going. We're going to have these ups and downs. That's life. Yeah. But in the long run, over a 10 year span, 20 year span, you're going to do really well with that, and it's minimal effort on your part. I'm not a financial expert. I'm not going to do well buying individual stocks trying to figure out this stuff. Yeah. And there, my time is better allocated to things that, one, I'm actually interested in, and two, that I'm actually good at that can turn into 
So and you have to know your limitations, essentially, instead of trying to be an expert at everything you do. Well, this is, you know, and, and like I said, that's why I think um, people can go out and look and a lot of social media or a lot of the stuff that he's put, that's been posted on Charles in the past is actually for me, it was the little life lessons that he gave that kind of go back to what you just said. You know, he was very much of the mind that um, if there's a job that you hate doing, you find somebody else to do it, you pay them 50% of, your, <laughs> annual, right. of your, your, your hourly rate and get them to do it. So, you know, I don't like to do my accounts, my accountant does them. So it's the same with something like this. If you're looking at it and going, I would not know where to start with uh, investing in the stock market then you're putting you one you look at you read and model on the people who are most successful at doing it and two you put your money in a situation where other people are modeling and tracking a stock market and and you know and and um i think tony Robbins wrote about it as well said you know long term you 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 will um uh, best the market because we're in a crash right now you see your your um your values go right down but every um bear market has been full, followed by bull historically so we're you know you right now but there's there's opportunities in that it's like yep. by buying furniture at a place that's going out of business you get these great yep. deals on stuff that would have been 10 times more expensive sometimes so for example the stock market dropped by 2000 points when this whole pandemic started yeah everyone's pulling their money out i maxed it out that day i go this yeah. is an opportunity because i don't need it back anytime soon now too now if i needed that money back in two months that wouldn't have been a smart play but if I don't yeah. need it back for 20 years, <laughs> it's going to do it. Yeah. So you're catching it low. So now, now you're going to catch the the recoup, and then you're going to catch the ascension, and that's yeah. essentially what's happened. Now we're in an up phase right now, for the most part. By the time I put this out, even though I'm, I'm probably going to put this out tonight, it could be different. <laughs> yeah. But that the thing about the stock market also is don't look at your account every day. Park it, forget about it. Don't go on there every day like, hey, oh, look at my – it's fun when everything's going up. You're seeing your, your net worth go up every day. That's fun. But it's not fun when it's going down every day for a couple of weeks. So don't yeah. check every single day because these daily fluctuations are going to drive you nuts. You're either going you're, to you're start calculating where you think it's going to go if it keeps at this pace, which it never does. Or you're going to get overly disheartened when it's dropping, when that's just a correction and it's going to it's going to balance out at some point. So don't worry about it. It reminds me of training. Actually, yeah. let, let, let's come back to training in a second. So I wanted to make two more points about this, why people aren't successful things. I think you have a you have a lot of insight on this as well. Now, the other one, and this is what happened with you when you were about to do that that news program that talk about coconut oil and teeth yeah. and health is people around you are like, don't do that. That's a bad idea. See, and that's the second reason why a lot of people aren't successful because they have friends in yeah. the sphere of influence. And sometimes they may be well-meaning. Sometimes they're not well-meaning. Sometimes they don't want you to be successful because it reflects on their inadequacies. But yeah. other times they're going, look, man, this is, this is, I know that you think this is an opportunity, but I think it could backfire. And they're just being well-meaning and it's up to you to decide whether you're gonna take that advice or not. But the problem is, is that if you're trying to be as successful as you can be, and I'm not talking about making as much money. I mean, that's if that's your goal, then that's relevant to this discussion. But whatever yeah. it is, you want to start a nonprofit organization and help victims of human trafficking. You want to get into real estate and buy and flip houses, whatever it is, that's a fairly big overtaking, undertaking. There's going to be people around you that just say that's not going to work. But based on what, what expertise do they have to tell you whether it's going to work or not? And people that are really successful, we're all a little bit crazy because we see opportunities that regular people don't. Nine to five guy is not going to see opportunities that entrepreneurs see. Yeah, That's one of the reasons, that's one of the signs that you are an entrepreneur when you can see opportunities that other people don't see. That's the sign when you have, that, that's a powerful gift or a learned skill. I'm not sure which one it is, maybe a combination of both. But, you, the, the, but then you have to have the confidence to keep pushing forward when all the naysayers are saying, there's no way this is going to work. No one believed I could pull off a six-figure income as a kettlebell instructor. No one. No one I knew at that time. My dad is like, he didn't say it, but he looked at me. He goes, okay, you're going you're gonna to teach people how to lift an iron ball with a handle on it in the park? This is a hobby at best. You'll yeah. be back doing that business development garbage you were doing at these internet companies in no time. That was the last job I ever had. Yeah. And he's 
like, yeah, you know, just give it a give it a couple of months, see how it goes. I go, no, 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 no. I'm not going to give it a couple of months and see how it goes because that's a loser's mentality. A, a winner's mentality is you burn your bridge and this is it or nothing. Yeah. I didn't get into this fitness business as I'm going to test the waters and see what happens. I go, I, I'm finally in the business I want to be in. I'm finally in the industry I want to be in. And there's no way I'm going to let this opportunity go. No way. This is my shot. This is my way to finally do something I enjoy doing and have great success with it. And I wasn't even concerned about making a lot of money anyway. That wasn't even something that I was worried about. I wasn't thinking, okay, I need to replicate the income I used to have in six months, otherwise this is a failure. I could care less about making money. I was so happy to do something that I actually enjoy doing. As long as I was making enough money to keep going, that was enough. And that's, yeah. all, it, that's all it has to be when you first start off. So many people are like, yeah, I, want to, I would talk to other kettlebell instructors. This is after I've had a few years of success. And I go, what are your goals with this whole thing? And some people who had only been teaching for maybe a week are like, I want to make six figures by the end of the year. <laughs> I go, You're not even, you haven't even made $100 yet. And you're talking about making <laughs> six figures. And also, yeah. why six figures? Why is it always six figures, right? That's the other thing. It's such a generic <laughs> thing. You don't even care. You're just, you're just pulling that out it because sounds it sounds good. good. Yeah. Yeah. What, like $85,000 a year is not enough? It's got to be six yeah. <laughs> then why limit yourself at six figures? Why not a million? You know, so these arbitrary numbers don't really make any sense either. How about you want to do something you really enjoy doing and you're going to enjoy the process as a result of that? They're still coming from this nine to five mentality of I hate what I do for a living. So I justify doing it because I make a good income. So they're taking that mentality and going, I can't justify pursuing what other people foresee as this crazy goal unless I'm making a good amount of money. Otherwise, exactly. people aren't going to think it's worth doing. And, and you know what, Mike? You have absolutely nailed it there. That's exactly what I've been telling my children. You know, my, uh, my daughter's coming up to 15 and my son's just turned 10. And I just say, look, you've just got to do what makes you happy. You've just got to do what makes you happy. And then it, 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 you're not working. You're not working in the in the conventional sense you know i've trained clients today and it's it's to me it's pleasurable it is um it's just a wonderful undertaking to be able to see these people help them on their on their journey and i think going back to what you were saying about the naysayers i think i always think of a, a crab a bucket a, a, a bucket of crabs even a bucket of crabs <laughs> You know, Don't you talk about? <laughs> that's another thing altogether. That's now, a weekend in Las Vegas. You know, crabs, yeah, that happens in Vegas all the time. You go home with yeah. crabs, but that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, you know, you've got a bucket full of crabs, <laughs> and you chuck one in, and there's, and it will try and get out, yeah. and the other ones will pull it in. So throw another one in. That one's trying to get out, and they're all pulling it back in, including the one that was just trying to climb out. I think right. inevitably people are. Um, there's there's a part that is, that, don't get me wrong, there'll be some people who are trying to cover your back and they don't want you to do anything that's going to damage your, your career. But then on the flip side, I think there are people who think if that person makes it or is it successful or does something like, that I, I couldn't do, that reflects badly on them. They think, no, no, just come back to here. You know, it's people when they're trying to lose weight and they've got partners who are like, no, I just have a take, a take away tonight. You know, we always, it's, it's reversion reversion to the mean you know you're just trying to drop people back down um and rather than supporting that upward trajectory and then maybe looking at your own life and saying well they're there why am i not i i not start doing a bit of self-analysis and i think that's the next thing that comes with it you start having to take a bit of uh, self-responsibility and looking at your own life and if you're not happy with where it's at then you've only got one person to really um speak to about it you know inevitably you can blame everybody else your partner this person that person inevitably the responsibility is at your feet so yeah. that's right yeah the more self-responsibility you're willing to take charge of the better and i've had yeah. that on a more trivial note i've had issues where let's say someone bought some of my products from another country and it's not getting delivered and it's not the customer's fault it's not my fault it's something to do with the the delivery company on their end or the delivery service on their end yeah. but Whose responsibility is it to make it right for the customer? It's still my responsibility. Yeah. So I can't yeah. go back to the customer and say, hey, we did all the right things. We sent it out and I don't know what's going on with your mail delivery service, but you need to talk to them and let me know what happens. Now, sometimes I will say, hey, just contact them and just let them know. And they get back to me and say, 
I don't know what they're, they're not giving. They're just giving me the runaround. I go, let me just send you another order then. I don't want you to waste any time with this. And I've actually gotten to the point now where I, I don't even tell them to look into it. I just say, let me just send you another order because yes. I have to take responsibility ultimately for this. You bought the product from me. So at the end of the day, I can't just deflect the responsibility to someone else. Now I can try to do that later. I can just send the customer a, a, a new order and then I can look into what happened and all that in the interim if it's worth my time, but I, I can't leave the customer hanging, even if it's not directly my fault, it's still my responsibility. So that's that's the way you have to look at these things if you wanna flourish. Otherwise, people are gonna be unhappy and when they're unhappy, they're gonna talk about being unhappy and that's not good about <laughs> whether it's your fault or not, You know, that's not gonna be good for your business. But don't you find that's what gives you most pleasure is the fact that all the benefits and all the um, prestige that your business can have is your work. So you're not contingent on anybody else. So when you look and somebody posts, you know what? Brilliant customer service could not last for a quicker turnaround. I had issues with the product and he absolutely nailed it. I, you know, couldn't couldn't recommend the company high enough. That is the moment where, like you said, because you came from a well, it's a different job, but you know, from when I read your book, I remember thinking his level of dissatisfaction with his work is definitely up there with mine. You know, my proudest day was being actually turfed out of one of the uh, cash and carries where I used to have to <laughs> take orders because I took a stand where in a meeting where they were trying to pull one a fast one and I just said no I'm not having it we're having people made redundant and uh, you know this is just ridiculous what you what, what they were trying to do was basically borderline fraudulent and right. uh, they said well you we shouldn't come back in and I thought at that stage you know what? I just cannot stand working anymore for a company or companies where uh, my loyalty isn't necessarily rewarded and also where you think, you know, you're making money for other people. All the success yeah. you have is is down to you. All the failures you have is down are down to you. You know, you have uh, and take it's ultimately taking full self-responsibility and moving on from there. You know, we get things and obstacles in our way. I don't doubt it. I'm not saying that every negative aspect that happens is completely somebody's fault. But as soon as you take responsibility from it and move on, then you are in control again. You seize control uh, once again from the situation. You know, so yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I think another one that I've been thinking about recently, just another impediment to success is when people that are successful take the time to help you out and you put them in a position where they have to follow up with you on what they asked you to do, that's a sign of serious disrespect. Yeah. And I think of when, when Pablo Sotsaline and I had lunch one time, this is when I was in the Dragon organization, and I was talking yeah. about I was using kettlebells and I was combining it with Charles Staley's EDT system and it was yeah. working really well for muscle building and so forth. And yeah. he goes, hey, write an article on that. He goes, write an article on it and I'll see if I can get it into Muscle Media Magazine. He actually took over Charles' column in Muscle Media Magazine. Yeah, yeah. yeah it ultimately went defunct, but it was a pretty good magazine at the time. It yeah. was more focused on information than covering bodybuilding contests and things like that. And I went home right after that lunch and started writing that article. And I had it finished by the end of the day and emailed to him. And even yeah. he was like, wow, that's a turnaround. And yeah. I was like, I was like, you are gonna go out of your way to help me out. Yeah. For just to be just being a cool guy. Yeah. The least I can do is respect that and not waste your time with, oh yeah, let me work on that. I'll get back to you. Yeah. And then, and then three weeks go by and I haven't sent him anything. Hey, Mike, did you write that article yet? And first of all, he's probably not going to do that because I wouldn't do that for someone either. I try to help someone out. I'm not going to follow up with them. <laughs> you know? no. you know? It's like either you're going to do it or you're not. And if you don't yeah. see the value of doing it, then I'm going to move on. But this, so that was my mentality too. And I, I've, I've had many examples of trying to help someone in the industry and they just don't do it. They just don't turn around in any... I've offered to do videos for people before I go, let's team up and do a video. Just come up with a concept and send me a, an outline of what you want to do. And they never did it. I had one person I offered to do a video project with and maybe a year later, this person gets back to me and he says, oh yeah, you know, I'm still thinking about what you offered. I go, well, you're the only one motherfucker because that opportunity is gone. <laughs> You kidding me? You think I'm just sitting around waiting for you to get back a year later? Like that opportunity, is gone. That, that opportunity is gone. <laughs> Frankly, you know what? It wasn't even a good idea anyway. So I say, I'm glad you didn't get back to me because I don't want to get in business with your bitch ass. What are you going to do? You can't yeah. even put together an outline. You imagine working with someone like that on a video project, which is a pretty big endeavor. Yeah. So, so that, that flakiness. 
Some, so many people are going, my friend Chris Prani has brought this example up too. He's in those jackass movies. He had a yeah. guy that, in Los Angeles that he was trying to help out. And everybody was trying to give this guy opportunities. And then a year later, he's leaving Los Angeles, tail between his legs, going, yeah, you know, I came out of here and it just didn't work out. And he goes, no, you didn't make it work out. You didn't make it work out. It wasn't because of lack of opportunities. Everybody was trying to give you an opportunity. It's, yeah. it's almost as if I, I can't just give you an opportunity. I have to do all the work for you, too. And that, then, then you'll be satisfied. I go, no, that's not the way life works. And this is the problem. You know, this is where we're at right now. Like I said, going back to what we were talking about before, that people have um, mistaken that having a debate or a discussion um, that you're right, that your beliefs have rights, you know, that what you believe. Um, right. and, and if I if I say something that offends you, um, that you're automatically right. I think it's the same thing. It's an entitlement. It's kind of like, well, I came to you with this idea. You said that you were quite gung ho for it. So it's kind of your responsibility to be following up as well on it. No, right. no. Right. You know, I've got, I've got, um, I've got an, another a business plan coming up right now, and I'm, you know, it's it's a, a joint effort, and neither of us been in touch with one another. Now I could sit around and just go, well, I'm going to just wait until that person contacts me, but I'm going to take action because if I want it to go ahead, I've got to be the one who consolidates that. You know, right. you can't be be get stroppy about it and think, oh no, I'll just wait for them to get in touch. They say, you know, you. you Life doesn't move forward that way. Yeah, you can't put in a half-ass effort and expect massive results. No. That's the other thing. People want to be successful without putting in the work. That's a big one. In fact, people market whole courses on how to be successful and avoid all these pitfalls when you need those pitfalls, you need those impediments, you need those failures. Those are inevitable. There's no way to avoid failure on the way to success. There's no way. It's impossible. No. And you don't even want to avoid failure on the way to success. It's a necessary ingredient. That's Absolutely. what's going to build character. If you just try to do something and everything just works out, everything every time you roll the dice, it works out, you're not learning anything. You're not growing as a person. There's an episode of The Twilight Zone where this guy dies and he thinks he's in heaven because when he first gets there, he goes to a restaurant and anything he wants is brought right out. He goes mm -hmm. and gambles. In every game he plays, he wins every single hand. And he goes, this heaven is horrible. And then yeah. at the end of the episode, the devil you says, really? you're, not in, you're not in heaven. <laughs> you're no. in hell. And then the episode ends right there. <laughs> because you've got no benchmarks against which to measure it. You know, if, if you're constantly happy, then you have got no benchmarks against which to measure that happiness. Right. So it becomes vanity. You know, no, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, I look back, certainly martial arts was a formative experience in my life that I learned that. It wasn't the fights or the competitions where I won that I learned something. It's when, when I got my ass kicked, where I thought to myself, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't bring it, you know, and, and that's where you come back better for it. It's the same with training, it's the same with anything. Program design, um, it's your failures that really demarcate how successful you can be. But oh, yeah. the key thing is, you know, I've always said, and I stand by it, um, it's not a mistake unless you repeat it. You know, it's a learning process. You know, right. it's a learning process. You've done something. It didn't have the, the response that you expected. You have to move forward and, and try something different and not repeat it. And, uh, you know, that's how I think anybody who's successful function. Definitely. Yeah. No, 100 percent. That's exactly right. And one more on this whole point about why people feel to be, be successful is. I actually forgot what I was about to say now. Let me think about it for a second. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you gave me some food for thought with what you're talking about. I'll come. I'll, I'll bring it back later. But let, let, let's switch gears into this. Let's talk about the pandemic a little bit, because yeah. what, what, what's life been out there for you for the last couple of months? Have you been have you been pretty restricted and are things opened up a little bit more? Uh, they're beginning to open up now. What we had was um, a the kind of unraveling the situation was quite rapid. So. Yeah. You know, I remember going away with my partner for a weekend, having a lovely weekend away by the coast. And I'm looking on my Facebook feed and I'm like, Jesus Christ, people are panic buying Lura. What the hell is going on? And this is, this, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about society, I don't know what does. Um, yeah. You know, I'm thinking, have I got enough protein powder? Have I got enough, you know, water in the house? If there's issues with the water supply? No, no, no. Let's just get Bob roll. Um, so... <laughs> I don't know whether I'm missing something there, whether it's high in fiber, but whatever. Um, and then it spiraled very quickly where um, 
we basically we put in uh, in lockdown and the 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 sort of legis legislation as it stood was that you weren't allowed out unless it was really for shopping um or to get one hour's exercise and um i think you know the well, the last count i believe england was the country to have the highest death rate so there are a lot of people now questioning the efficacy of lockdown um and they're, they're, it, it's it's a, a situation that's kind of it is polarizing the country quite a lot because we're looking at countries like finland sweden uh, and japan that operated different systems that have had don't get me wrong they've also had um a high mortality but not in the same rate as we have so yeah. they're, they're question marks and i think to be honest with you you know you read about these global conspiracies i don't think our leaders are that um that that uh smart that they could coordinate all this stuff i think right. what happens is that in situations like this you double down don't you if i'm if if um if you're going to do something you can't go okay we made a mistake we overreacted um right, right. everybody you know um you know i'm very very blessed a lot of my clients are in the medical field so i talk to them and obviously i haven't done seven years in medical school so i'm not claiming to have any uh, superior knowledge but i'll ask them questions and you know, a lot of them will say two meter rule is a nonsense. If you sneeze, the the aerosol droplets will fly six meters. So why not six meters? Um, you know, then we have right now we've got the whole masks are mandatory. But of course, that's a nonsense because you've got a virus that's I think 0.12 microns in size going right. through a mask that's you know. So unless you're wearing I don't know a, a surgical quality mask, and so we, we've got all these situations that are that are kind of um, we're battling against and and meanwhile i think my my greatest concern is that we've got an epidemic of mental health issues we've yeah. got record suicide um, yeah. obviously i work in a field where i'm in contact with people who are counselors and they said that the the levels of domestic abuse are absolutely horrific um, that child abuse you know going back to your friend yeah. tyritta who i'm i'm yeah. i can't admire more what that guy does is incredible um yeah especially in the wake of watching that Epstein documentary, you know, I just thought um, if anybody hasn't seen that podcast, they really should, because um, that is outstanding work that he's doing. But, you know, we're looking at a situation where, and this is my opinion, um, the, the net effects of the actions we've taken are going to be worse than the projections of the disease. So we've yeah. got a decimation of an economy. That's a fact. Okay. Yeah. We'll probably go into a global recession now, maybe 10 years. On top of that, you know, it's a well-known economic statistic that for 40,000, no, for 1% of unemployment, uh, for every 1% unemployment goes up, 80,000 people die. Sorry, yeah. 40,000 people die. 40,000 people die as a result. Now, that's more than all the people who died of coronavirus right. in this country. And we're looking at, um, it will definitely be more than 1% unemployment increase in this country. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah, that's where where the situation is and it's 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 a concern it's a concern and not least as, as well because i think that that we are we're in a kind of like for want of a better word it's like flat earthism gone rampant you know we don't we don't go okay what what can i do about this how can i take self-responsibility this goes back to the conversation we had how do i take self-responsibility for this right i'm overweight i don't do any exercise uh i smoke 20 cigarettes a day and uh i'm i'm 39 percent body fat but we just wait around for the vaccine yeah. we wait around and go do you know what fuck it i'm going to sit on my sofa i'm going to do nothing i'm going to watch netflix and i'm just going to wait till you know <laughs> till bill gates comes up with something and you think i don't know when did we rely on millhouse from the simpsons to provide health care you know he can't keep viruses out of windows 98 so why are we suddenly thinking that he's going to be able to um, same point yeah exactly <laughs> quite frankly if i want to talk about kettlebell training i'm talking to you if i want to talk about how to clear cache and defrag my laptop i'll phone microsoft support you know so um I, I'm, I'm I'm at a loss as to understand that, but I do think it's um once again I don't necessarily think it's um I think large corporate interests step in at this sort of juncture and say right this is a great opportunity you know as far as I'm um, aware you know R and D in the pharmaceutical industry has taken a bit of a hit over the last years and so 
you know, like we all know in our industry, you've got to generate business. So how do you do it? Well, what you did was you segue from kettlebell training. You did eBooks, you did um, um, se seminars, and then you started your own line of supplements. So it's diversification of your 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 business. Yeah. If you're in the pharmaceutical industry, you need new illnesses, and um, preferably where you can turn around and say, well, we've got a successful result with this. Personally, I'm I'm of the mind that. Um, we're seeing things like zinc and hydrochloroquine. I think it was Dr. Mark Gordon you were speaking to. Oh. Um, uh, you know, some very interesting results with that. We're looking now at what I said to people at the beginning of the pandemic was um, they were like, well, what do you think we should take? I said, I think at the end of this, we're looking at a situation where those who had low vitamin D levels are going to be the ones who are hardest hit. And we're looking at that now as a statistical it's fact. It's coming out, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I even heard that they, they're potentially using it for treatment pro protocols or certainly it was mooted that it was going to be used as a as another test. That When you go into ITU, the, one of the tests that they would give you is um, to check, check your vitamin D3 status. And, and so I think that there are safer, um, more efficacious methods um, than vaccines, you know, and I've got my own views on that, which, you know, we can go into. But I, I quite frankly, I think... Um, even even if vaccines are completely and utterly safe, no negative implications whatsoever of them, why aren't we just saying, well, let's just have, we've got a global, uh, what, a, a national epidemic of obesity. Let's tackle that. Let's yeah. tackle that. It would be a lot cheaper. You could have subsidized personal training, subsidized nutrition. Absolutely. You know, if the government approached me and said, would you be, able to, would you be prepared to do some free talks or whatever? I'd, I'd be happy to. I'd be yeah. happy to. But, of course, you know, uh, for whatever reason, that's not being not, that's not on the table right now. It was, it was never part of the narrative in America either. And we here in Las Vegas, we were never as restricted as what you're describing. I could leave the house anytime I wanted to. There just wasn't really anywhere to go besides the grocery stores. <laughs> <laughs> I took my dogs to the park every day as I normally do, but all of a sudden everybody in town was coming to the park because there was nowhere else to go. So the park was Grand Central Station now, yeah. and now it's going to get back to normal, thank God, because th that really ruins our really nice park out here in the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. We weren't that restricted. I mean, it wasn't where I had I could only leave the house for an hour, or I, I mean, there were people driving around. I don't even know where they were going. There, there were a lot of cars on the road at all times. I think people were just bored. They go, let's just get in the car and go drive around. Let's go see what the strip looks like right now. It's never going to be like that again. So yeah. we weren't, it wasn't as bad here. And my business wasn't really affected that negatively, fortunately. Initially, I thought it might be, but it, it really, really rose to the occasion. I mean, it actually showed that this business model is can sustain itself through some pretty serious situations. So I was happy about that. But that doesn't mean that I'm not thinking about all the other people who were affected. Just because I'm doing okay, it doesn't mean that everything's okay. There's a lot of people out there, especially in a town like Las Vegas, where it's a hospitality, a hospitality town where a lot of people come here for tourism and so forth. There's so many jobs that are predicated on that. Yeah, and when yeah. that whole industry shut off, it became really problematic. But going back to your point, there was never anything in the news about there's never been a better time to take charge of your health. Yeah. Make your respiratory system as resilient as possible. Make sure your vitamin D levels are optimal. Make sure you're taking vitamin C. Eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Eat a clean diet. Eat organic food. Those are all things you should be doing anyway. So it wouldn't have been controversial even to put that out there. Is it really controversial to say – eat some fresh organic food, no matter what your dietary is. I don't care if you eat meat or you're vegan or whatever, eat the highest quality food you can get. That wouldn't be something where it'd be like, there would, if there's any backlash to that, we're a really soft society. You know? And then exercise, there's the, when you look at the statistics of people that are dying, it's generally the majority are people with high blood pressure, with diabetes, maybe they were cancer survivors, they had some kind of compromised health issue. Now there have been some people that were healthy that died or had serious symptoms, but that's the minority. And there's even been people that they showed in the news like, oh, look at this guy, he's a bodybuilder, he's 6% body fat, and this guy almost died from it. And they're trying to use that as a example of someone who's really healthy, yeah. and in my mind, I don't know if that guy's healthy. I don't think he's healthy just based on his body fat percentage. For all I know, he's a total stimulus addict. This guy could be taking 500 milligrams of caffeine before each workout. He could be sleeping five hours a night. He could be yeah. genetically gifted. That's why some people I know who are genetically gifted, they're ripped no matter what happens. They, they could eat anything they want and they're 
So we, just because someone is lean and, and looks like they had they embody health doesn't mean they're healthy. That person could have low testosterone, which is really important for your immune system, yeah. low growth hormone, crucial for your immune system, DHEA. It, it's way more complex than, oh, he has a good physique, so he must be healthy. And see, even healthy people can succumb to this. So it was, it was this negative narrative as it's almost like you're telling people don't bother trying to be healthy because that's not going to help. You'll yeah. Just wait for the vaccine and just wait for some drug intervention. And th so so. And then also talk about a missed opportunity. It was about two and a half months here where people were stuck at home and a lot of people are getting these stimulus checks and unemployment. Okay, yeah. fine. What are you going to do at that time? Are you going to sit around and watch TV all day like what you're talking about? Or are you going to yeah. finally say, hey, finally, I have time. It's always My excuse was always, I don't have time to work out. All right, well, now you have all yeah. the time in the world. You can work out three times a day if you want to. At the very least, you could go for a one-mile walk and build from there every day and then start looking at how to improve your diet instead of eating garbage all the time and thinking you have no control over any of this stuff. Me, personally, I made respiratory health a priority. And I'm, yeah. I, I was already making it a priority because I had a horrible case of the flu last year, which turned into pneumonia. That's and, cool, yeah. And it, honestly, it took months, months for me to feel good after that. It really fucked me up. I mean, my lungs got filled up almost like the, the pneumonia I had in 2002. So this isn't even the first time I had pneumonia. But this time I recognized the signs. I got treatment a lot faster. I actually had a company come over here that provided emergency care treatment in my living room. So that was really convenient. I didn't have to go to an emergency room, but I needed that treatment. And it, it took a long, it didn't take a long time for me to get my strength back, lifting weights is maximum effort. A couple of weeks I was back to where I was before that, but my energy and my cardiovascular health took a big, big hit. Just walk, going for a long walk, I would be tired afterwards. And even when I was lifting heavy weights, I would have to take long breaks between sets because I was just exhausted, just yeah. mentally pushing through it. So I realized then I, I really need to take charge of my cardio vascular health. I've yeah. sidelined it for too long. I've been too focused on all this maximum effort stuff and I'm naturally good at endurance. So I didn't really feel like I needed to allocate time towards it, but blood pressure was elevating my glucose, which I was usually really good was starting to elevate. So I go, I need to do some additional interval training type work. Yeah. And I started doing elliptical training because that's easy. It's, it's, it's sustainable. I did it at the gym three times a week, just hitting it hard because I can put music on and I'm not the most coordinated guy. So I can get on that and just push it really hard for 30 minutes. And that was hard initially. And then it wasn't hard after a while. And I started getting better at it. Then this pandemic hit and I might go, okay, what am I going to do? I've got weights at home. So that's not a big deal. I could go do sprinting at the park, but there's too many people at the park right now and the weather's getting hot. So I, I need something that is convenient. So I, I actually bought a gym quality elliptical trainer for the house so I could get that in. And I was doing that three, four times a week. And people are like, oh, are you even lifting weights anymore? I go, yeah, I'm lifting weights twice a week right now, maintenance. But right now the focus is respiratory health. So that if I come in contact with this virus, if my lung capacity is at a super high level, let's say it's normally here, and then I get hit by the virus and now I'm all the way down here trying to deal with it. But if I have it up here and I get hit, now I'm here in the middle. So my chances of recovery are a lot more pronounced. And also the fact that I had pneumonia last year, it makes me more susceptible. So that was more reason to really make sure my respiratory system is on point. But also yeah. sleep. Make sure your sleep is optimal. That's when you rejuvenate. Get eight hours of deep sleep every night. There's no excuses right now. You don't even have to wake up for anything tomorrow. Eight hours of deep sleep. That should have been a priority. Healthy eating, priority. Some kind of physical exercise, priority. Fresh air, priority. Yeah, reconnecting with loved ones, priority. There's, there's so many things you could have done yeah. that I think a lot of people did. And I'm just basing this, this totally conjecture on my part. It's not like I've done some kind of statistical analysis where I've knocked on every neighbor's door and said, hey, what did you do during the last two months? But just, just observational conclusion is that most people didn't take advantage of it. They were too busy watching the news and in this doom gloom state. You know what? This is why, obviously, I always enjoy our conversations because, um, I, I, you know, I just could not agree more. If you said to me, what did the government do wrong? I would say everything because you're 100 percent right. If if you put me in charge, um, <laughs> I would have said, look, you know, one of the things that we need to really focus on right from the get go is the mass panic. You know, people would were were, um, were talking about um you know, feeling suicidal, feeling absolutely uh, terrified by the situation as it stood. And right. you know, some sort of stress management was really what was called for. We needed somebody to turn around and say, look, this is a grave situation. We're not in any way denigrating that. But actually people panicking, people being um, uh, terrified of what's going on, 
because you and I know um, from from our own uh, work that stress management is key because stress right. is going to suppress your immune system. Well, right. if you want to really open the door to something like this, then that is that's the way. You know, it's gonna it's gonna um, completely put yourself at risk. And, and then, like you said, um, doing some like exercise. To, I mean, I was doing more strength training. Because I thought I don't want to do metabolic training and, and suppress my immune system too much. That's I, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you've got all these people doing crazy stuff on oh yeah, you know, lose 20 stone while you're in lockdown. And you think, well, these are people who haven't exercised in ages and they've gone from one extreme to the other. And now yeah. they're going too far. extreme. Yeah. But, <laughs> so I was doing, doing that and and you know, going for leisurely runs, um, getting on top of my sleep, supplementing appropriately, and, and you can stack the deck very firmly in your favor without oh, yeah. a doubt. You yeah. know, you don't have to. You don't have to be in a situation where you're spending a lot of money out on it. Um, but I, I, when I contacted my clients, I said to them, look, irrespective of your goals, whether it's fat loss, you know, muscle gain, strength gain, whatever, whatever it was that they wanted to do, um, I said we're going to be focusing on stress management over this period. I said I'm going to be doing, you know, qigong. I'm going to be. I did a Facebook live um, Tai Chi class. Um, I was, and I, I threw out a lot of the stuff that I've learned over the years, whether it was emotional freedom technique, whether it was deep breathing, whether it was Tai Chi exercises, Qigong, acupressure points, because I thought, I don't care. There's no right or wrong. Like, you, I think, you know, you use hollow sync uh, meditation. Yeah. It's whatever works for you. And, and meanwhile, I did exactly what you did, which was take responsibility for my res respiratory system. And I signed up to do uh, the Wim Hof online course. So, you know. I, I went up to, you know, being able to hold my breath for three minutes, comfortably getting into cold showers. Um, nice. and, and yeah, and I loved it because it gave me some focus as well, because I'm somebody who needs structure. And, yeah. uh, you know, and it's quite nice to have somebody outside go, right, now this is what you're going to do today. So, yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, Mike, just very quickly, do you need me to put the light on? Because I'm mindful of the fact that the sun's gone down and it's getting darker. Or That might be a good idea just to brighten it up a little bit. I mean, it looks okay right now, but if you, if you turn it up a little bit, I think it would be good. Yeah, cool. I'll be back in a sec. Yeah, yeah, sure. There we go. That looks good. Yeah. No, I was just mindful of the fact that you said you can edit it, so I thought, well, we can just cut that bit out and then... <laughs> oh, I don't do any editing, so it's basically live. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> There, there's a, the Steve Cotter clip. I mean, there's maybe two minutes where he had to go to the bathroom, and I was going to cut that out, but I was like, nah, I'll just leave it in there. <laughs> like, it's, just, it's not live, but it might as well be because there isn't any editing. <laughs> I haven't developed that skill. See, the, only, the only thing I know how to do right now is get on Skype and push record and then push stop recording and then upload it. So anything beyond that is is beyond my skill set at this point. I'll, I'll pick those <laughs> As I go along. <laughs> That's why I'm only talking to my actual friends right now instead of having Robert Green on where he's like, hey, man, you put up my clip and there's there's five minutes of me walking around the house in between this this and that segment. <laughs> no, no, I'm not playing that game. Yeah, with the. Uh, actually, I, I just thought of this other success point. So let me just flip gears. This is how my brain works. I'm real schizophrenic. I just go from idea to idea. But. <laughs> The other thing I wanted to say about reasons why people don't, one of the other impediments to success, and this is one more on what people, the compromises people feel they need to make to be successful. Yeah. Like you were talking about how, hey, I'm putting up stuff, stuff on Instagram that's deemed as controversial and maybe I shouldn't do that, but it's important to you and it's authentic to you to put that up because those are things you believe. So you're not putting it up to be controversial. You're not putting it up to get... Uh, so, so, trying to some kind of viral post that guy, th those aren't your motivations. And I think what happens to a lot of people is when they get into this industry or any industry for that matter is they lose themselves along the way. Who they are is gone now. And yeah. if, if you lose yourself in the process, it's not a victory at the end. You had to become something that you're not. You had to, you felt that you had to be inauthentic. And that's the, the trade off you made. And now you have to continue to be inauthentic. You have to play this person you're not. You have to be in character all the time. All the time. Because that's, yeah. the way you, that's the way you've presented yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you come out of the gate authentic, and you're going to take some flack for being authentic, that's up with the territory. But so what? The, the, you can, you'll actually be less stressed because you're not trying to be something you're not. Yeah.
You're gonna be yeah. you're gonna you're gonna be much happier because you don't have to put on this facade, and you're not gonna have this this weight on your back of if I run into someone, I need to go into character. If I if I'm about to give a lecture somewhere, I need to turn this up. And we all yeah. go through different stratums of our personality, so it's not something where it's you're always the same person to everyone in every situation. But at your, at your core, your values and how you present yourself that should be consistent. So if someone reads my book or meets me in person or watches my video or sees a clip on Instagram, there should be some consistency among all of those mediums rather yeah. than just like, wow, he's totally different than his book or he's totally different in person than he was on that. And there's going to be a little bit of variations, but it, but there's, there should be a level of consistency. Then you're, then you're going to be a lot happier with whatever you do. And this is the thing. I think that at the end of the day, you've got a situation where people are um, you can't be, yeah, I'm uber confident when I'm online, I'm like this and, and you talk in a certain way. Um, and you get that a lot. Like, you know, you put your finger on it before. We've got these Instagram um, influences, a load of bullshit <laughs> online. You know, yeah. people who, who trade off this um, faux authenticity. Right. right. And it, it's bullshit. You know, um, I, I've taken a lot of steps in my professional career that people thought were mental. You know, I, um, I learned. Uh, emotional freedom technique which is a system of, uh, of of tapping various acupressure points to release negative emotions and people are like oh, that's woo woo bullshit and and i was prepared to you know uh, my view has always been to to counterbalance that with understanding and research so if you if you could if you said to me well all right but how does it work i don't understand it then you need to you can't just go into stuff one because it sells and you get a lot of personal trainers who do that you know you get them oh this is all the rage that's all the rage and they sell, you know, I've never done anything unless I was passionate about it. You know, my first course with Charles was nothing to do with, um, with, with his program design. It was because a friend of mine had come back and said, look, he's got this system that spot reduces fat. And, you know, if you've got man boobs, you take zinc for it and all of this. And I was just like, that sounds, well, it sounded mental, but also it was fascinating. Yeah. So I started to read about it. And, you know, for me, what I'll be blunt. I think what Charles did, which was genius, was he packaged functional medicine and basic functional endocrinology into right. a package and sold it as this is a fat loss method. But do you know what? Truth be told, I primarily used it for things like clients with sleep or disorders, clients with chronic joint pain, uh, clients with gut dysfunction, because yeah. actually what I got from it was it was like saying, look, I, I bought you a Porsche. It's outside. You could just drive up to the drive up to the local, you know, Seven Eleven and buy a, a Sprite in it. You, that's that's kind of using it for such a minimalist uh, right. approach. Um, yeah. And and so it really and and I, I think ultimately the combination. Um, and I don't think I've ever mentioned this to you actually. Um, certainly not that I can recall. Ultimately, what I learned from Charles and what I learned from the hormonal optimization that I did with yourself, I think. I have credit with saving my life. You know, I got Lyme's disease around 2010. And, and this is why I kind of get a little bit irate maybe about the coronavirus is that my first symptom wasn't a temperature and a dry cough. My first symptom was a suspected heart attack. Yeah. And, then, and then the symptoms of what seemed to be a multiple sclerosis, pins and needles, muscle twitches, nerve, you know, uh, uh, sleep that was just completely erratic. You know, you'd wake up and jolt. And... I remember thinking, you know, being able to reverse engineer it once again and, and think to myself, well, this looks like adrenal dysfunction, but there's something else in the mix as well. And, and so I kind of studied and studied. And, and I don't think uh, I would be around had it not been for the resources that, that um, people like Charles and yourself gave me, because I went, you know, back to basics, taking a lot of magnesium that calmed the muscle spasms and the nerve pain. Um, and and then I started researching it in in um, in earnest. So you know, and 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 you know, another sorry. While we're on a slight um, sidetrack, but you know, I, I wanted to mention it. I don't think you realise sometimes the net effect of things like your podcast generally, because I listen to a lot of the ones with uh, Dr. Mark Gordon, specifically about head injuries, the damage it does to the HPA axis, DHEA um, issues, and. Um, a very good friend of mine was was boxing, was knocked out, had a brain bleed, and um, months later, after recovering ostensibly, was talking to me about all these issues he had 
around things like libido, about just feeling like, you know, what we call, nah, you know, just like, uh, I can't be bothered to do anything. I don't feel get up and go, you know, little moments of, of temper. Yeah. And I said, you need to go and see somebody about this because it's, it, it, it is, you know, it's what I consider to, and, and I get, and fortunately, you know, like I said, I'm a personal trainer. I'm not a doctor. I'm somebody who's got an interest in hormonal optimization and, and I know my limitations. So I was like, you know, but as a springboard, download these podcasts, listen to them and reference them. So if you do find yourself butting heads with a medical fraternity, and I found that myself um, yeah. when, when I was going, you know, it's all in your head, you know, all this crap, you, you're being told that it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's psychosomatic, um, that at least you've got something that you can actually point at and say, well, listen, this guy's a real expert in his field. You might want to listen to it and, and, and take it from there. So my point is that the information you give out, it might be a one week podcast. You might think, oh, that was a good one. But the net effect and how it can impact on people's lives can be very, very profound, you know. Well, that, that's great to hear. And that's really what we that's really the most in the most exciting aspect of doing something like that is yeah. that you're putting out potentially life saving information. The episodes with Ty Ritter, you're putting a spotlight on a serious issue in an organization that's actually doing something about it. So that's been the most, those are the kind of episodes that I enjoy doing the most. Yeah. Doubt. And what's interesting, when I first got into hormone optimization, I first started research, researching it. It was, I was going through libido issues myself at the time and de depression. And depression is something that I always have, but optimizing hormones has allowed me to manage it way more effectively than before yeah. I learned how to optimize hormones. So it was more mood and just lack of sex drive and lack of zeal for life. And this is after I'd gotten into the business. So I knew it wasn't because of what I was doing for a living. It was easy when I was depressed, when I was doing something I didn't enjoy, because you could just say, okay, it's because I'm doing this. But yeah. when you're still feeling depression, maybe a year or two into doing what you really want to do, then you have to start looking for other clues. So I got into hormone optimization then, and most doctors you spoke to about hormone ops, hormones, and it hasn't changed much, but then they would just say it doesn't matter. Like, oh, testosterone doesn't matter. You know, your levels are supposed to go down as you get older. I would hear that a lot. They go, as long, as long as you're in range, they felt like it wasn't an issue. Okay, well, if the range of testosterone is 280 to 1200, that's a pretty broad range. Yeah, yeah. So then, you're trying to tell me that if I'm at 282, that's enough because I'm actually on the statistical range. And that's all that is, is a statistical yeah. range of people that have gotten tested. Yeah. A thousand people got tested and here was the range. Yeah. So if you're in that range, you're okay, it's normal. Well, normal doesn't mean optimal. I don't care exactly. about normal, I care about optimal. And every man has a number for every hormone that's optimal for him. So you may, you may need to be at 850 to feel your best. I may need yeah. to be at 700 to feel my best. Someone else may, may only need to be at 500 and they feel fantastic. Someone else may need to be at that 1200. So you don't know. You don't know until you start playing around with these things. And I think yeah. what also happens is that as people get older, they get used to the decline because the decline is not happening right in front of you. It's happening very gradually over time. It's a gradual and erosion. Right. So you don't, if it, if it were dramatic, in other words, one day you have a great sex drive and then the next week it's completely gone. You know, then you're going to be like, whoa, what's going on here? I need to do something yeah, about yeah. it. But it's a gradual decline. It's like, hey, I'm losing a little bit of muscle mass, but it's not that big a deal. Then over the course of five years, your, your physique looks completely different or your mood's a little bit off and you're like, yeah, it's okay. I'm just getting older. Five years of declining. Now it's a serious depression and it could be a hormonally related depression it's related to your endocrinology not your bio not because not your natural biochemistry or your circumstances it's circumstances yeah. in your life so, so the, the hormone stuff to me when i looked at it, i go this is such important stuff why isn't anyone really talking about it and really no one was talking about it in our industry i learned later that charles was talking about it but it, but it, but it wasn't something that is as widespread as it is now now you see hormone optimization left and right and everybody thinks they're a hormone optimization expert they read one book and Jillian Michaels wrote a book on hormone optimization and she doesn't know jack shit about it, you know? but it was just a buzz term now. It's like, hey, everyone's talking about a hormone, so that's the next thing. And that's the, that's the problem with the fitness industry and any industry most likely is that people jump on to whatever the, the current trend is. So yeah. when I first started doing kettlebells, nobody's doing it, it's not a trend. Then it yeah. became a trend and everybody jumped on it. Now it's ubiquitous, kettlebells are everywhere. Yeah. 
initially it was this tool that was strange. People would see you using it. They're like, wow, what's that? When I first started snowboarding as a kid, I was 14. I would go to a ski resort and my brother and I would be maybe two of 10 people that actually had snowboards. Everybody had skis. So every time you got on the chairlift, someone would be like, wow, what's that? And uh, how'd you get into this? It was, it was a novelty type thing. It was considered strange. In fact, a lot of skiers didn't even like snowboarders. It was almost this, uh, this battle, like, why are you doing that? Why can't you just ski? I was like, I'll tell you what, I, I hate those fucking boots. They're the most uncomfortable things in the world. And <laughs> snowboard, snowboarding just looks cool. Remember Roger Moore and Beat Away Kill? That's what got me into snowboarding. That scene at the very beginning of the movie. And that obviously wasn't him. It was a stunt double. But I go, I want to do that. That looks cool. And then, and then all of a sudden, snowboarding became trendy. Now, if you go to a ski resort, it's more snowboards than it is skis, skiers. So these things, these things happen like that. People jump on trends. The problem is, is that when someone jumps on a trend and now you have all these voices throwing in their two cents, most of those voices are nonsense. They're, they're not adding any real value to it. They don't know what they're talking about. And that can be really confusing to someone who's trying to learn more about this because you read one book and you go, okay, I think I have a grasp of this. And then you read another book, which is totally antithetical to the first book you read. And now there's a level of confusion. So that's why I like having legitimate experts, Dr. Mark Gordon being foremost in my mind. When I think of the number one legitimate expert on hormone optimization, I think of him. In fact, I'm going to have him on this show probably later this week or next week because yeah. he is not a guy who's trying to sell products. He has products, but he's not. that's not the focus of his business. He's not trying to push his supplements out there. And he donates a lot of his time to treat people with PTSD and TBI without making a dime. Yeah. I mean, he basically donates hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of time, meaning that's what he could make if he wanted to allocate his time elsewhere to genuinely help people. Now, that's a clear sign of a genuine guy with really good intentions. Yeah, Does I mean, I agree with everything he has to say. No, sometimes I hear something from him and I go, eh, I don't know. And it's not so much that I think I'm so knowledgeable. Like, who am I to challenge him in any way? It's just that he's not all knowing. And he, he admits that. And that's the other thing I appreciate about him. He came on the show one time and he was talking about aromatase inhibitors and why he doesn't like using them because it has this side effect, that side effect, aromadex, of things of that nature. And he'd never heard of my estrogen blocker. So I brought it up. I was like, man, you should have people on EC. And he's like, well, what's that? And the, yeah. I I named out the ingredients and I sent him some information about it. And he goes, hey, can you send me a couple of bottles? I'd like to have some of my people try it. They tried it. It worked really well. He gave me a nice testimonial for it. And now he uses that in place. He wasn't, he didn't sit there and go, Mike, who are you to tell me what I should be doing with my patients? He didn't, he wasn't arrogant saying, how could this guy who has no medical background or nutraceutical background possibly come up with something that would be useful to my people? Yeah. Yeah. He gave it a shot. He, he read the information. He gave it a shot. So that, that's something I really respect about him. Well, this is it. And I think, you know, that goes back to one of the things Charles used to say, which is that you've got to learn to earn. And and I think yeah. once again, you're going to have a situation where you've got also people who are who are, for me, the financial aspect comes as a direct result of all of the fact that I love to learn these things. So it doesn't feel like I'll learn this and my, my income will go up exponentially. Right. It's because I'm interested in it and then it makes you more knowledgeable. And then somebody will say, oh, you know, you should see my friend. They're struggling with this that, and the other. So it's an organic process. And you're right. You know, you, it goes back to giving of your time without wanting anything back. And, um, yeah, you've got people out there who um, uh, are doing stuff like hormonal optimization simply because they think there's a financial reward. Oh, right. I'll be able to see a load of supplements off the back of this and be completely unethical and and um you know the more the better you know i was my my first thing and this came uh really off the back of doing by signature was that when you start doing it you're looking at stress and how you can mitigate stress so you get right. obsessed with, oh well we can take this we can take siberian ginseng we, the fact of the matter is you've got to go back and say well if i can eliminate the bloody stress I'm done. I don't have to worry about, you know, um, taking this or that to su supplement my adrenals. If I've got somebody who's, if I'm in a relationship that's not working or I'm in a job that I detest, you can take as much cordyceps as you want. You're right. still going to this shitty right. job every Monday. So I, I reversed it and I started to look at things like, like I said, emotional freedom technique, things like um, uh, gratitude diaries, stress management. And then what you can do from a much more 
um, ethical standpoint is you can say, just take this. So instead of going there, this, this, you need this and this and this, and somebody's got a shopping list, you can reduce things down to really the essence and say, what you really need is this to support yourself. And, and you actually save people a lot of time and money and actually help them start to have a more productive lifestyle. Because, yeah, you can't you can't out supplement a, a, a shitty life. You really can't. You really can't. What, what can help, though, is let's say you have someone who has a job he hates and he's in a relationship that is not working out, but he doesn't have the energy to get out of either because it takes energy to do that. Especially if you've been in a relationship for a long time, it's not easy to just say, I'm done with this and I'm going to go through the hassle of disconnecting from this person because that's going to be a process, especially if you're married and have kids and things of that nature. And then if you're at a job, it's for most people, it's not as simple as I'm just going to quit today and follow my passion tomorrow yeah. because you have responsibilities. You're an adult. You have bills to pay and so forth. But what can help is let's say you're at a job you hate and you're in a relationship you're not happy about, but you start focusing on your health and you start looking at improving your hormones. Yeah. And your testosterone goes from 300 to 800. Your free testosterone goes from non-existent to top of the range. Your DHA is up now. Your growth hormone is coming together. Your pregnenolone is good. Now, what's going to happen? Are you really going to be the same person after all of those things have improved? Most likely, you're going to have so much invigoration and so much energy that now you start going, I feel really good. And it's time to take charge of my life and get rid of things that are not working for me. This job yeah. sucks. I'm going to figure out a plan of how to get away from this job and get into something I like this relationship is not working for me. So we're either going to go to counseling or I'm going to get out of it, but I'm not going to just be miserable for the rest of my life. It takes energy to handle those kind of situations though. And if you're in this really hormonally depleted state and you have adrenal issues and your, your brain chemistry is poor, the balance between your neurotransmitters is off. It's a real battle of attrition to try to make any major change when you're in that state. Yeah. Yeah. When you can improve someone's state, even moderately, they're going to start looking at the world differently. It just happens. It happened to me. When I learned how to improve my hormones and testosterone's up and my DHEA is up, I feel like I'm, the, I'm, I'm becoming a better version of myself. I'm still the same person, but now I'm supercharged. Yeah. This yeah. is as close as you can get to a superhero type thing where Captain America is this skinny little guy and he goes in the chamber and he comes out all jacked, right? <laughs> this is... It's not as dramatic or as fast as that, but it's, it's a transformative experience. And I've seen yeah. it happen where I've read about in books where, let's say, a husband and wife go to the doctor to get treated on hormonal issues and only one of them follows the advice. That relationship is not going to last because now you have a guy who's hormonally optimal and his wife isn't and she doesn't care to be. He's yeah. going to look elsewhere. That's just the reality. It's not a moral judgment. It's not him like, oh, he's a bad person. He's just going to leave here. I'm not saying it's going to happen quickly like that. I'm just saying it most likely it's going to happen at some point because that guy's going to be miserable. He used to be miserable and he's not anymore. His yeah. wife is still miserable and she doesn't want to improve. Where do you go with that? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if they yeah. both are on the product, yeah. you know, now they're on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're back to the crab metaphor we had earlier about, yeah. you know, People, one person moving on. If 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 you are in a relationship, both people have to be traveling at least you know in tandem. And uh, yeah, if you've got somebody who's uh, because everything you know we consume is having an effect on our neurotransmitters, right. uh, detrimentally or positively. And and if you if you are you know um, you're eating junk food all the time and you're you know maybe you're, you're not producing enough dopamine or enough acetylcholine, yeah, you're going to just find that you eventually. You know, you feel more, yeah. And so as soon as you do start to find those maybe body composition changes, those hormonal changes, yeah, the sky's the limit. And then and then if, if other people aren't moving along with you in life, then it, some hard decisions have to be made sometimes, yeah. Right, right. So that's just the, the caveat to you got to quit your job to be happy and go pursue something you want. The caveat to that is, well, maybe you need to improve your endocrinology first so that you have the energy to go do what you yeah. want because it yeah. takes energy. And like Steve Cotter brought it up, he goes, sometimes we have people that have been miserable doing a job they hate forever, but now they're 60 and they don't have the energy to get into yeah. what they really want to do. So you, you got to have, if you're not youthful, you want to have as much youthful energy as possible. And that's what hormone optimization allows. It's not a fountain of youth, but no. a 
it allows you to slow down the deterioration that is just natural part of living is there's going to be some deterioration, but that doesn't mean that we can't do anything about it. There's a lot you can do about it. And we see all kinds of examples. I remember when I was a kid watching a TV show, if there was a guy who was 65, that guy looked like he was 90. Yeah. You know, now you have people like Schwarzenegger and Stallone and you have all these jacked guys in their 50s, 60s and beyond. Then you have people like Clarence Bass who's been on the podcast. The guy's 80 and he's like 6% body fat all year round. You know, so there's so many examples now of people that squash that myth. And he brought up a good point, Clarence Bass, that is, where he said, a lot of people say, oh, I'm getting older, so my metabolism is slowing down. More accurately, your activity level is slowing down, and that's why your metabolism is slowing down. Because what happens when people get older? They're less energetic and you're more sedentary. Mm -hmm. So is your metabolism slowing down just organically, or are you playing a role in your metabolic health going down? Also, your hormones are declining and you, all those things have a negative effect. Your thyroid health is not as good as it is anymore for a variety of reasons, mainly because you've, you've eaten a crappy diet for a long time and you haven't trained. Because if you did those things at a young age, and that reminds me of Steve Maxwell. A lot of people tell me, they're like, oh, man, I look, I look up to Steve Maxwell because he shows me what's possible at his age. And I go, okay, that's great. But you have to look at the story in its entirety. Yeah. Steve Maxwell has been an athlete since he was 10 years old, and he's never yeah. stopped. He was a competitive yeah. wrestler. He was in the military. He started doing BJJ when he was in his late 30s and became the first one of the first black belts in America. This is a guy who has dedicated most of his life to being a physical culture culturist and a healthy lifestyle. He didn't just start when he was 50. He's never been out of shape. This guy's never been overweight and he's never been out of shape. Maybe by his standards he has been a few times, but not by anyone else's standards. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that doesn't mean that you can't look up to him as an, as, as an aspirational goal, but you have to take the story into its complete context. He's not a guy who started working out when he was 50 and he was obese for 20 years and then he got himself in shape. No. So be excited about that example, but also, also shows you the importance of what's possible if you dedicate yourself to a healthy lifestyle at a young age. You can, you can at the very least maintain a certain level of vitality for a long period of time, much longer than you would otherwise. A hundred percent. And that's one of the things I found, you know, um, I think you make a really good point because it's a positive, it's, it's a, a positive role model to aspire towards. But what you don't want to do is, I mean, how old is Steve now? He's, He's got to be in his 60s now. Yeah. You know, you can't unfortunately get to, to my age at 50 and say, I want to look like that, if you've right. only come to that realization at 50, because right. you're absolutely, you know, it's the same as when I did martial arts, I was very fortunate. Um, the, one of the guys who was in the class ended up playing Darth Maul in Star Wars. Oh, he was really? The guy, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Ray Park. Park. Yeah, yeah, Ray Park, yeah. Lovely guy. And, and you know, I remember we, we all did an ex exhibition somewhere, and he, he did, uh, I think it's Star Form or Sword Form, and people afterwards were like, yeah, that's wicked, mate. I, I'd love to be able to do that. And I looked at them and I thought, not being not being critical, but I thought, there's no way you're ever going to do that. This guy gets up at five, six o'clock every morning. He trains in the park. He he works in order that he can supplement himself and go abroad. You know, he um, he's never at the pub. You know, I wasn't either. You know, Friday nights when every, a lot of my mates would be like, oh, we're going down to the pub. We had weapons class. Do you actually think I give a shit about having a beer that night when I can use sword, spear? You know, you're learning all of this sort of stuff. It's, a, it's once again, it's about what feeding into what you love over, you know, those sort of casual enjoyments. And um, yeah, and look where you got him. But you couldn't suddenly look at it and go, that's what I want to do within a year. Well, it's, it's not enough to want something. You have to be obsessed with it. You have yeah. to be almost psychotic about <laughs> achieving that goal. If you're not obsessed with it, if you're not, if your eyes aren't getting bigger when you're talking about it and all of a sudden your posture is changing, you're not going to achieve that goal. It has to be an obsession because it's going to be really difficult. And the only way you're going to blast through all that adversity is because you're obsessed. No matter what, I'm going to achieve this. And yeah. my, one of my favorite shows is 24. I mean, yeah. it, it was, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's not on anymore, but it, was, it has nine seasons, ten seasons. Anyway, yeah. the Jack Bauer character played by Kiefer Sutherland, his level of obsession with getting the job done in each season – that's the level of, of, of obsession you need when you're pursuing your goals. And people are like, oh, come on, that guy's a TV character and he does all these crazy things. I'm not saying you have to do things he does in the movie. All right? <laughs> I'm just saying 
his mentality of we're going to stay up. The, the whole show happens in 24 hours. So we're yeah. going to stay up all night working around the clock to achieve what needs to be done. That's what we're yeah. prepared to do. Yeah. So that mentality, you need to take that into whatever it is you're trying to achieve, whether it's a 600 pound deadlift or 300 kilo deadlift or a, I want to have 50 people at a kettlebell certification, or I want to write a book on hormone optimization, or I want to be a professional speaker and talk yeah. to the youth about how to stay motivated. Whatever it is, is you have to be obsessed about it. This this casual, this casual, I, this casualty of just being casual about doing something is not going to work. This let me just put my foot in the water and test the water, see how it works out. No, you got to jump right in. You jump right in without any idea of how you're going to uh, sink or swim or what's going to happen when you jump in. That's yeah. just necessity. It just has to be that way. Well, this is it. And you're looking at a situation where you can't be a part-time genius. You know, you have to absolutely engage with things uh, at 100% or not at all. You know, I, 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 for me, I knew I was in the right job when the books that I read um, were my career jobs, my, my, were my career books, you know. So I'd, I'd get excited about this, you know, book on kettlebell training or this book on um, body composition or hormonal optimization or whatever it is. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to... to to engage in it as much as possible. It's not a case of, oh, I've got to sit down and do this. You know, like you, I think you signed up for that Yale course on the science of well-being. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I signed up for half a dozen courses right at the start of this. If anything, my, my issue has been kind of buckling down and doing one thing. Oh, for yeah, full I, disclosure. Didn't make it, I didn't make it through that course for full disclosure. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think I even made it through the first lesson. It just didn't vibe with me. So I was like, oh, well, this is not for me. But I mean, I think, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a cool concept and just the delivery wasn't really a fit for me, but I'm not obsessed with that topic either yeah. because if I were, I would have, I would have gone through the process necessary. I mean, you made a good point about some people are going, okay, okay. Hormone optimization. That's what we're doing now. So I need to learn about that to augment my income. And yeah. this is very complex stuff. And it's a lot of times it's not even that interesting in terms of the way it's written that you're going to have to go through research and if you're not obsessed with acquiring this information, you're not going to last. You're no. not going to last at all. And also, it takes a lot of tinkering, just self-experimentation to figure out what works. And there's going to be a lot of things you try just on yourself that doesn't work at all. And you're going to be like, man, I just spent 16 weeks using that protocol and my numbers didn't budge. Yeah. And, and, and it can be frustrating at times. And then you go on to the next protocol and boom, you get it. You got it dialed in now. And you're like, wow, it was worth it. But there's, there's going to be a lot of frustrations along the way. And if you don't have that obsessive nature about wanting to acquire this information, I mean, after all of these years, I've been studying hormones since 2006, I want to say, I think is when I first really started looking into it. So we're looking at 14 years later. I'm still really obsessed on this topic. Yeah. I still watch lectures on YouTube. I still go to courses or buy courses. One thing I did do is I bought the anti-aging conference in vegas last year 2019 i mean this yeah. is probably 100 hours of material and you can buy it for 400 bucks i bought that in a heartbeat i went through all of it during this pandemic so i basically took the entire event in during this whole lockdown and actually yeah. it was better than attending because when you're attending you have to pick and choose which ones you want to go to i'm not a morning guy so i'm probably not going to wake up at 6 a.m to be at a lecture at 7 15 you know unless it's something i'm really into but yeah. this allowed me to get all that information in a way that works for me and then go through it at a pace where I can, yeah. I, where I can really absorb it. So sometimes people, they go, why do you still study this stuff? Don't, don't you know enough? I go, you can never know enough oh, no, no. More to learn. And it's always changing too, because more research comes out. Absolutely. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why I engaged with biosignature and hormonal optimization so well was when I did the first course, to be perfectly blunt with you, it blew me away. I was absolutely, yeah. there were so many things that he casually dropped into conversation. And I walked away and I just felt that I, I'd missed a lot because I didn't have the knowledge base for it. You know, he's talking about gene SNPs. He was talking about MTHFR gene. He was talking about um, uh, aromatization. And I wasn't even really familiar with, with what that would involve. So I went away, and in between that time and the time I recertified a year later, I just read, like you said, obsessively, because I was fascinated. I wanted to sit there and really feel that I was getting the very best out of the course and that I could ask pertinent questions that I felt 
I, I you know, weren't either covered or that I, I misunderstood. And um, and it was because of that, you know, and I never stopped. I never stopped. You know, I still listen to the, the conversations you have with Dr. Mark Gordon. I'm, I'm constantly reading uh, different sources and, and studies. And it, it's it's what kids gives you the juice in the job as well. You know, it's what gets you up in the morning because you feel engaged constantly. And it, and it's and let's face it. I imagine you're much the same as me. There are only so many times you can be counting reps or uh, designing a program. You know, it's it's that ongoing uh, process where you feel that you're developing as a person that is more important than um, because otherwise I think you could flatline in this job really easily. Oh, yeah. you know, if I look at it and I think to myself, there was no component or requirement for continuing professional development in my job. I think some people would just go flatline and and have, have you know done the courses they've done and maybe they'll do a course on you know whatever kettlebells just because it's become trendy or power you know battle ropes because they've become trendy you know absolutely I mean that's why I stopped teaching kettlebell courses it just wasn't exciting anymore I did it yeah. for a long time I did it for well over a decade I traveled all over the world teaching it and it was fun while it lasted but it got to a point where I go this it's becoming too repetitive it's too much yeah. of I'm saying the same things. I know exactly what problems people are going to have. It's it, it wasn't dynamic and exciting anymore, and that's okay. Yeah. And it's okay to it's okay to move on. And that's the other thing some people don't get is it can be disheartening for people when they have the courage to finally pursue what they want to do, and then several years into it, it's not that exciting anymore. Yeah. And sometimes it's not exciting because you're burned out. You just need a break. Sometimes it's ex it's not exciting because you have some issues with hormonally that you need to address. Other times it's not exciting because you're ready to move on to something else and that's okay. You find something else to pivot into. And one thing about my, the, the one consistent thing about my career is that I'm always, I've always pursued things that I'm interested in. It was never about, let me make this to make money. It was always, this is what I'm excited about at the time. It's almost yeah. a timeline of, I got into kettlebells. I'm super excited about that. I made a DVD on how to get bigger and stronger with kettlebells because that was my focus. I made a, a video on how to lose fat and develop mental toughness. And I, the, the first hormone optimization information I put out on an actual product was my fat loss DVD, which is not available yeah. anymore, but something that came out in 2007. So you, you can you can see the evolution of me just pursuing my goals. None of these things were financially motivated. There was no reason for me to think that me learning about hormones would be monetizable in some way down no. the line. There was no reason to think that. And I wasn't even thinking that. I wanted the information for myself. Like I wanted the kettlebell information for myself. Yeah. So I think that that's one thing. But to see the thing about me is I'm only good at things I'm interested in. When yeah, I was a yeah. student, I've said this probably several times on the podcast and on even on this show in previous episodes is I wasn't a good student until I got into religious studies. Yeah. And specifically Eastern philosophy, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sufism, et cetera, Islam. Once I got into that, there was a gravitational pull of this is really exciting to me. And all of a yeah. sudden I became a good student as a side effect. I went from just being satisfactory to using grades as a barometer exceptional. I was on the Dean's list and all that jazz. Now it wasn't because I was pursuing any of those things. I never cared about that. I didn't care about recognition or getting honors for a thesis or any of that stuff. But those things happened as a result of me finally gravitating towards something that pulled my interest, captivated my interest. Yeah. And at the time, my father is going, because my father is not a religious guy at all, so it was it was a double whammy negative to him. He goes, I'm paying for this college experience for you, and you're <laughs> choosing something that I really could care less about, but it's not about him. I'm the one in, in college, not him. But he's thinking, you got you to pick something that's going to get you a job afterwards. And that's really yeah. bad advice, because nothing you pick is going to get you a job afterwards, because you're, you don't have any work experience. So you might yeah. as well pick something that you actually enjoy because nobody cares about some guy who has a bachelor's degree in, in business administration administration with no work experience. You're worthless. You don't know anything. You've just been in a classroom. What do you know about real business? Nothing. You're going to be – you're going to have an internship at a car rental place before you get on to any real job. Not yeah. that there's anything wrong with those jobs. Okay, but – that was, a that was a lesson I learned really early that, hey, if you actually enjoy something, you're going to be really good at it. But if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to be good at it. So these jobs I had, I was never good at any of them. I was good enough to keep the job, but I wasn't excellent at any of those jobs. And when I'm not pursuing excellence, that's really disheartening for me because I'm prone to depression as it is. So the yeah. last thing I need is something that's going to tip me in the direction of depression even more. And that's what these jobs were doing. And I was in a really negative relationship at the time, too. 
So once I got fired from that job, which is the best thing that ever happened, it was it was the beginning of a cleansing product pr process. I got fired from the job. I was in a really acrimonious relationship. And that finally, a year into the business, that was out of my life. And all of a sudden, I was at this level of freedom of, hey, all these negative forces that were in my life are gone now. So now let's just really push the pedal down and see how far we can take this thing. But it was a lesson I learned early, but it was a lesson that I didn't, I, I didn't think was a practical move in the real world because you have this grandiose idea of what you want to be. And I was really into fitness at that time too, but I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about getting into the fitness industry. So I, I didn't know what I was going to do with this degree. I just knew that I enjoyed the material. I didn't yeah. want to be a college professor, so I knew that was out. So I got lost like a lot of kids who graduate from college. You start re quote unquote reality kicks in and you feel like, okay, I'm just going to have to compromise and do a job like everybody yeah. else. I've got to make money and I've got to do something here. I can't just live with my parents for the rest of my life. I actually have to take some responsibility for myself. And then that becomes a trap because what happens when people get a job they don't like is they buy a house because they want to feel better. They yeah. buy a nice car. They start spending a lot of money because they're trying to make up for the fact that they don't enjoy that job. So now yeah. it's even harder to leave though, because now you need that job to keep paying for your lifestyle. Well, you invested in that lifestyle as well. Right. You're financially invested in that lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. So if you just quit your job, then that whole lifestyle that you're accustomed to may go away. And yeah. you might have to be okay with that initially. That's that's a trade-off that most people don't want to make. I remember years ago, this guy, he was a he was an executive at Oracle. I don't think super high up, but high enough that he was making a pretty good salary. I think he was making 250000 a year or something like that. So he said, I want to do what you do, Mike. I want to get in your industry. You know, How long do you think it would take for me to duplicate my income at Oracle? You know, $250,000 a year. I go, look, it may take five years. It may never happen. And you can't go into it with that expectation. Because that is, you, you just can't, that, that, that can't be something that's important to you, that you have to make this certain level of income. That income may come as a side effect of the fact that you love what you're doing. Yeah. I make way more than I ever expected to make in this industry, but that was never something that I pursued. Yeah, I wanted to make money and have a good lifestyle, but that wasn't foremost on my mind of let me go learn things that I don't care about because I can monetize those things. Exactly. Exactly. No, I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's that passion that drives. It, it's, it's what keeps you fresh and keeps and th that will attract by definition people to what you're doing, to your model. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, for me. I can see such a commonality. We've we've gone our own divergent paths in terms of, but I can I can certainly make linkages with what you're saying. You know, when I did, like I said, mentioned before that EFT tapping, I did that because I was listening to a podcast and specifically about Lyme's disease. And the woman there said, "Look, you know, you're never going to get actually rid of any illness unless you get rid of the undemotional in the, um, you know, the the blocked emotions." Yeah. And I could, you know, as a man. We're like, I've, I'm on top of that shit. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't need, I, I, I'm, I'm engaged with my emotions. But it also, it also correlated with something Charles had once said. And it was one of the most stunning things he said. He just put, said it as a throwaway comment. But I remember writing it down because it was, it was so, um, well, so incredible. He said, every chronic injury that is not going away has got an un emotional underpinning or something to that effect. I've still got it written down. Or an, a, an unresolved emotion behind it. Oh. And I'm like, that's an incredible thing to say. That's an incredible thing to say. So something in your life has maybe told you you're not strong enough to do something or not uh, physically able to do something. And maybe you resolve that, that emotion. And, and the kind of th the way I would best explain it is it's like um, emotional doms. You know, we go through the stressor and then it's that delayed onset muscle soreness. We've now countered the, the, the stressor and we're now in the resolution phase. Well, I, I did it. And I've qualified because like you, I'm obsessive. So I thought I could see a practitioner. No, I decided to be a master practitioner and do it myself. And so, um, you know, but that love of what I did, I just, it just kind of shines out of you. So I'm right. talking to my clients about this and they're like, that sounds amazing. So what tapping these acupressure points does what? And you're explaining and more and more people came to see me and it became a business in and of itself. So you know, um, tapping, seeing people as a master practitioner was part of my business. And it was both separate because obviously you can see people uh, who have just come to see you for lifestyle considerations. It can be sports performance and it can be a part and parcel of training. So you've got somebody who's turning around and going, I just don't know what it is. 
in my life that's stopping me making these steps forward you know tapping into the subconscious mind and starting to make real change there is the most powerful method for oh, yeah. and so yeah. so if you can start to access that in a very very um straightforward safe and effective method then you can start to make incredible strides forward because you know you might just have somebody and they come for eat because the linkage is that they may be uh, I don't know, when they were sad as a child, grandma would give them a biscuit in the kitchen. And that was the link. That's the link. You know, you've made that. No, you don't look back at it as a 42-year-old man and think the reason I, I crave this, even that particular, you know, because that's all lost in the kind of waves of time. But coming, being able to access that and release it and know that you can let it go safely, um, yeah. so it gives you, a, 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 but yeah, you know, and it was because of stuff like that yeah. and learning that. It becomes it becomes a business. It was I never did it for the business side of things, but it just happened that it was. Yeah. So no, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Yeah, that's great. Now I like what you said about the subconscious mind because we get way more messages from our subconscious mind to the conscious than the other way around. Yeah. Now, I often yeah. use that as an analogy with hormones because our hormones have way more impact in how we think and feel than how we think and feel affects our hormones. Yeah. So if. And people hear that, they go, that, that does, they'll, they'll, they're very incredulous. And I always say, well, look at a woman who has really bad PMS symptoms and tell her, just get over it. It's like, it's all in your head. Get over it. She's going to get stabbed. <laughs> she's going to stab both your eyes out and rip your head off. It's impossible for her to not feel the way she's feeling because of the hormonal messages she's getting. However irrational it may be or however crazy it may come off, it's impossible for her to feel otherwise. That's the first thing you have to realize. So these these trite advice of you know you need to go meditate or just get over it or just relax, you know, take a deep breath. That's like someone finding out their mother just died and saying, "It's only you don't need to be sad. You know, just just look at the positive." It's like no, you're going to be sad, and it's okay to be sad. Sadness is part of the human experience. It's not something. It's unavoidable, and it's a yeah. sign that. It's a positive sign in the sense that you wouldn't be sad unless it was something that meant so much to you. And the fact that you experienced something that meant so much to you is one of the best, biggest pleasures in life. So if you're going to have this, this really amazing experience in life, you're going to have some experiences that are on the other end of the spectrum, too. Yeah. It's just a reality. So that's why that's why I'm so passionate about getting hormone advice out there, because I know the impact it can have on people. It's not going to cure everything. Like I said, I, I've had depression for as long as I can remember. And I've, I've gone to therapy where I've been by, by diagnosed as on the bipolar spectrum, not high end. I'm functional. And I've said this a million times, but I keep bringing it up because I want people to understand that it's OK to talk about these issues and it's OK to get treatment on it. And just because yeah. I understand all this stuff about hormones doesn't mean that I'm not someone who can benefit from that line of therapy as well. There's hormone therapy and then there's actually talking to a professional, not one of your friends, because that's often what people counter. They go, you know, I've got close friends. They're good listeners. I go, your friends are biased and they're not professionals. So I don't give a fuck what your friend had to say about this. A professional is going to give a professional is not your friend. You know, he or she is not trying to be your friend or tell you things that are going to make you feel better. She's there to dissect what you're saying and tell you her analysis, whether you like it or not. And that's what yeah. you need. And she's a professional. Right? The person I go to is, I keep saying she because I go to a female therapist. She's a professional that this is what she's dedicated her life towards. And she's really good at it. So it behooves me to not only pay for her advice, but really take it in and apply yeah. it. Because you can always improve. There's always things you can get better at. Yeah. So a lot of people deal with depression and what do they think they need to do? They go to a doctor and a doctor says, let's get you on medication. And now sometimes there's a place for medication. I'm not saying that no one should be on medication. There's definitely a place for that. No doubt about it. But it shouldn't be the first step for most people. Mm -hmm. I agree. It should be something where it's the last resort or maybe it's used for a certain period of time to get you through something. And this is just my advice as, as someone who researches these things, not professional advice, but that's where I look at it. Because it doesn't address why you're feeling that way. You're sugarcoating it. I don't yeah. feel good, so let me take a pill so I feel better. But the, 
this the situational forces or the converging forces that are causing you to not feel good have not been addressed. They're still there. So you're delaying the inevitable, just like in some ways, here's a crazy analogy, but it's going to pull back to the pandemic a little bit. I feel that this whole lockdown was just delaying the inevitable. And what I mean by that is, okay, fine, we're all going to stay home. We're, we're all going to socially distance. And maybe that's going to lower the infection rate. We don't know for sure if it was an effective strategy or not. But let's say theoretically it was effective in the short run because we're not in contact with each other. Eventually, we have to open things up. Eventually, we have to have some return to normalcy. We can't all just stay at home and get stimulus checks for a year. Yeah. Two months was already devastating. Imagine a year of doing that. Yeah. What happens when people start congregating again? The numbers are going to go up, and that's what we're seeing now. Now the news is like, oh, you know, we made the second wave is here. No, it's not a second wave. It's the first wave that we put on hold by yeah. locking everything down. This is what my theory anyway on this. So the only way through this is through it. We got to go yeah. through it. We got to have as many people going through it as possible so we develop that herd immunity, and then the virus just has nowhere to go anymore. We can't, we can't just try to evade it. Here's the virus coming. We're just going to get out of the way, and it's just going to keep going that way. It's yeah. just it's going to stay with us as long as it takes for us to develop that herd immunity, and then we're going to move past it. Now, people hear that. They go, well, this percentage of the population is going to die, and that's going to happen regardless of whether we stay locked down or whether we open things up. Because like I said, we can't stay locked down forever. So I, I always felt, and look, I understand there's very smart people on both sides of the argument, and I, and I, I take the time to listen to both. And they, mo they both, both sides make compelling arguments. This is just my conclusion, listening to both sides. So it's just my opinion. But it, it, it felt to me that it was a total overreaction to say everyone needs to stay home as much as possible to protect the vulnerable in society. That's a small percentage. Yeah. People with underlying health issues and so forth, maybe people at a certain age. I understand why those people should stay at home. I understand why maybe people over 65 that are, have some compromised health issues are, are more susceptible to developing serious symptoms if they come into contact with the virus. I understand why they should stay home and socially isol isolate themselves as much as possible. But that doesn't mean that everyone else should. And I never understood why we couldn't find a happy medium of you can't force older people to stay home either, but you can strongly encourage it. And then you can say, look, young people, you can go out there, young and healthy people, but these are the recommendations we have in play. Now, if you want to wear a mask, that's great. Wear a mask. But we're not going to require everyone to wear masks. If you run a business and you feel better about your customers wearing a mask when they come in, that's your prerogative. And if the customer doesn't want to do it, they can go somewhere else. So I, I didn't see any, any nuance in any of these discussions. It was very just these binary points of either we're going to just stay open and just let the death toll take its, run its course or we're going to all socially isolate. And then people look at Sweden and they go, well, their death toll is higher than neighboring countries, Denmark. Right. But we don't know what the totality of deaths is going to be until, let's say, at least a year out, looking back. What, are the, what, is, what, is going to, what is going to be the totality of the numbers after this is all said and done? My guess is it's going to be fairly close, just based on the experts I've listened to. And, but they're not they're – the, the, economic, the devastating economic consequences – they're not going to feel those as much, Sweden, as the neighboring countries. And what, what role is that going to play, as you said, into a continuation of a high death toll that is not directly related but is related? So these things are a lot more complex than a lot of people want to, want to consider. And I think you're right. I think on top of that, we're not even allowing for the fact that anybody who's had a child knows that the first few weeks are back at school, the kids come back with runny nose. Upset right. stuff. Why? Because they're back in contact with other children. They're hugging them. They're playing with them. They're having muck around fights. It's a cross pollination of bacteria and it's essential. Why is it essential? Because it's our immune system getting a bit of training. It's not lethal. It's just a little nudge. It's just an uh, armed forces getting some actual active, um, uh, encouraged physical activity, but they're not actually at war. 
And right. what we've got here is the potential for coming out of lockdown, I think. And a second wave, I think you're right, we've either delayed the inevitable, in which case it's not a second wave, it's the first wave delayed, which right. is really what, what their argument was anyway. They said, well, it, certainly in the UK, I don't know, I can't speak for America, but was if we delay this first wave, then it means that there are less resources that are going to be taken up by the NHS. But I think that we're going to mistake that second wave as just people getting normal coughs and colds. You know, we've we've had issues over here with testing, the, the validity and accuracy of testing. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's been the same with you. You know, um, yeah. you know the, you've got uh, certain countries where I think they tested fruit and found coronavirus on it. So, you know, you, <laughs> you, you it's um I, I even i mean i had to laugh because we we kind of pride ourselves on our on looking at things from a scientific point of view but i looked at one particular uh testing company and they they said basically we can test you and if it comes back negative that doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't had it right and if you get right. tested it may come back positive but that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get it again so i thought well that's a waste of <laughs> money you know for me my my position was always you're better finding where your vitamin d status is and acting on that taking responsibility on that saying bloody hell my you know my yeah. vitamin d levels are very low i really need to start boosting them um make your but, immune system your gut health as resilient as possible most of your immune system is in your gut so you want your gut health to be on point yeah want your hormonal health to be on point. And then there's there's things that are, they're somewhat theoretical, but there's some data that these mechanisms may work. And I wrote that article on quercetin and zinc yeah. because just like hydroxychloroquine, and I never heard this argument in the media, why hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine may work. And the mechanism for why it may work is that it's a zinc ionophore. It, it pushes zinc into the cell membrane so that the cells can protect against the virus and replication. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Okay. Now, quercetin is a natural compound with a lot of benefits, actually, for joint health and immune system already that does the same thing. It's also a zinc ionophore. So yeah. It doesn't have any negative side effects that long-term use of hydroxychloroquine could have because it's a malaria drug that's been around for a long time. So yeah, I don't even yeah. think... I don't even think the negatives of using it are that big of a deal for most people because you would probably only be on it for a week or two. It's not something yeah. you would take as a preventative, although our, our president's taking it as a preventative, but that doesn't make any sense to me. It's not something yeah. you want to take casually. But something like quercetin and also EGCG, a green tea extract, that's also yeah. a zinc ionophore. So you could take a combination of both of those extracts, one or the other. And then you could take, you don't necessarily have to supplement with zinc if you're getting enough in your diet because it's just going to drive the zinc into your cells. But if you want insurance that you're getting enough zinc, you supplement with some zinc as well. And that's a very inexpensive protocol that stacks the deck in your favor as well. And it's more precise than just boosting your immune system. Yeah. And again, it's theoretical that it may be effective against COVID-19, but there have been, there is some data that quercetin has worked against SARS in other earlier iterations of the coronavirus. Because this is, there've been many coronaviruses. Now, this is not the 19th one. I hear that people saying, oh, COVID-19 is the 19th one. No, it's not the 19th one. It came out in 2019. All right, let's get it right, man, before you make these stupid ass arguments. That, that's there. And, but we've dealt with SARS, we've dealt with Ebola, we've dealt with other things that are basically variations of the coronavirus. So if it works against SARS, theoretically it should work against COVID-19. At the very least, it's worth taking for the other benefits. So even if it doesn't, it doesn't pan out to do what this theory may say it does, it's still worth taking for the other benefits. And I've, I've been taking it the whole time. And frankly, I'm gonna keep taking it indefinitely because if you want the full benefits of zinc, you have to get it into the cell membrane. If you don't get it into the cell membrane, you're not getting the full protective powers of it, not just against COVID-19, but the seasonal flus and colds, anything that you want your immune system to be resilient against. So this, this kind of information should have been pushed out there a lot more. And I, I, I think it's, I think our media, specifically talking about America, and it probably wasn't much different out there, did a real disservice to us by just creating this heightened panic level. Every day we're seeing the death toll go up and it's very dramatic when they present it. Breaking news today, the death toll has now passed 100,000 and counting. Don't worry about so hospitals are over flooded. It looked like a whole war situation. So yeah. you're just putting people, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't report the news as it's happening, but you don't have to dramatize it so much. 
you don't have to just overly fixate on the negativity of what's going on out there without giving people tools that they can yeah. use to protect themselves and to rejuvenate their health so that they, even if you do get the virus, if you, the healthier you are, the less likely you are to have serious symptoms. You may not have any symptoms at all, but the best thing you can do is make yourself really healthy so that if and when you come into contact with, and if it's as infectious as we're led to believe, we're all going to come into contact with it, assuming we haven't already. Yeah. And what you want to do in that situation is be as asymptomatic as possible so that you're not in the emergency room, so that you're not overwhelming the medical care system. It's like everyone needs to stay home because otherwise we're going to overwhelm the medical care system. Okay. Actually, everybody needs to be fucking healthy. So that we don't <laughs> overrun the goddamn medical system because it's being overrun by people that are not healthy. And that's not a moral judgment on people that are not healthy. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying a fact here. So if you if we want to do our part to not overrun the medical system, let's be as healthy as possible so that we're asymptomatic and be and can stay home and be treated as opposed to thousands of people rushing to the emergency room being put on ventilators. You know what? And on top of that, we've got the crazy facts that. You know, thousands of people are going, you know, Jesus Christ, I've got this pain across my chest, down my arm. I'm, I'm not going to overburn the NHS. You know, we were sold this bill of goods, which was, for fuck's sake, protect the NHS at all costs. Do not use it unless you absolutely have to. So people did that. People did that in record numbers and people died in record numbers. And yeah. it was nothing to do with coronavirus. It's yeah. because you said, sort of you know, I, I won't go in. I won't get my diabetes medication. I won't have my cancer checkup. I won't. I've got this steering pain across my chest down my arm. I'm not going to do anything about it. And so what happened was then they said, well, why the hell weren't people coming in? And you're like, because you told us not to. And because it was such a guilted thing, you know, you phoned a, uh, any any. Um, uh, GP surgery or anything like that and they were all saying you know we're closed right now this is only for emergencies and and yeah. people obviously just thought well Christ they've got more fish to fry and uh, yeah and, and you know what this comes right back to what we were saying right at the start it is just people not taking responsibility do you know what if you are sat at home throughout this still carrying excess body fat unhealthy unfit and this hasn't kicked you into gear and this hasn't motivated you to doing anything, then there's a serious problem. Yeah. Then that is really a serious fucking problem because what we're looking at is a society that is so continued. Alexa. Switch <laughs> off. I can't find Alexa. Alexa. <laughs> stop. Right. Um, that thing drives me crazy. <laughs> it's which is on in the middle of my Tai Chi class as well and starts randomly coming out with stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah, where were we? So yeah, we, we were saying- right, right. I mean, and America is one of the unhealthiest nations in the world. And that's one of the reasons why our death toll was so high and our hospitals were overrun in certain areas. They weren't overrun everywhere. Like Nevada wasn't, I mean, people died here and I don't want to diminish that in any way, but it, it, we could hardly say that our hospitals were overwhelmed in Las Vegas or Nevada in general. Even if the number were several times higher, I don't think it would have yeah. overrun our medical care system. But what role can you play in not overrunning our medical care system that doesn't require you to shut down your business and not make any income and stay home? There's there's yeah. more practical steps that all of us could have taken. And frankly, if we were a healthy nation, healthier nation to start with, it wouldn't have been as big of a deal. People still would have died, but it wouldn't have been at the level that we have. And that's assuming that all those records are accurate, that they're all directly COVID. And that's another argument, which unfortunately we don't have time to get into because I actually have to get out of here. <laughs> well, listen, I'm, talking, I'm sure you, know, you, you have to go too. We've been talking for over two hours here. And this is, you know, what's funny is when I started doing this show, it was, it was a way of, in some ways, just catching up with friends. Yeah. I'm going to catch up with friends because a lot of us never talk to each other for a variety of reasons. And I go, why not make some content out of it too? Because... We're yeah. not all going to go into character and have these contrived uh, conversations. We're actually going to have a free flow conversation like you and I did when you were in Vegas a couple of years ago yeah. at that restaurant. And so that basically I'm just taking that experience and putting it on a platform and sharing it with others. But uh, where can people find out more about you? What's, what's your website and your social media stuff? Um, um, well, um, it's, I'm trying to remember it off the top. It's Alan Levy PT is my Instagram and my Twitter. Okay. <laughs> and it's, um, Alan Levy personal training.co.uk is the website, which desperately needs an upgrade. If you <laughs> I'll tell you what, you're talking about pushing into action. I'm looking at that and thinking, shit, that is really old and creaky. 
and then uh, Facebook is only personal training. But I just want to take the, the opportunity to Mike to thank you uh, for having me on because you know there are so many people who have been on the shows who I'm such an admirer of, whether it's Steve Cotter, Steve Maxwell, yourself, obviously um, Charles was on it, Christian Tyretta. So to be in in you know a list of of people like that is is a, a real honour and a privilege to me. So I wanted to thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, if ever you want to do the chat again, you know, I've, I've loved it. To me, like I said, um, it's just like catching up with a mate on the phone, you know, and uh, if other people benefit from it and get information or knowledge that helps, then that's great. Yeah, and that's exactly what I wanted to be. And yeah, my pleasure, man. It's great talking to you. It's great having you on. This was a fun conversation, a lot of great information. So we'll, we'll definitely reconnect down the line. And so let me go ahead and stop recording here because I want to make sure. I saved this episode. This is how informal I am. Instead of having some, some like, okay, folks, make sure you go check out. I'm, yeah. I'm, actually, I'm actually purposely not even mentioning my website or anything I do. I'm just keeping this purely, just pure conversation. Let me go ahead and yeah. start recording.